requires to be done at home uh, to ensure that our preparedness is up to scratch. Thank you. That ends the statement from the First Minister on Ebola. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 11976. In the name of Fiona Hislop on winter festivals, members who wish to speak in the debate should press the request to speak button now. And I think it would be helpful if I advised members that we are extremely tight for time this afternoon. Uh, so you really do need to keep to your time and we can't make any allowances for interventions. So can I call on Fiona Hislop to speak to move the motion, Cabinet Secretary, 10 minutes. Uh, Presiding Officer, in the first debate of the new year, can I wish all members from across the Chamber Happy New Year. Uh, it's a very appropriate time to reflect on and debate Scotland's Winter Festivals and in particular I welcome Claire Baker to her first debate as culture spokesperson for uh, the Labour Party. It was eight years ago when the first SNP government initiated the concept, policy and funding for Scotland's Winter Festivals to boost the national and international celebration of St Andrew's Day, Hogmanay and Burns Night and to show showcase the very many reasons why Scotland is a year-round visitor destination. Of course, these dates were always celebrated, but what the Scotland Winter Festival programme helps to do is to harness the significant collective potential of these key events by showcasing across the entire winter season the exciting range of events and activities on offer that promote and celebrate our distinct traditions to the people of Scotland, our visitors and to those with an affinity for Scotland from across the world. Scotland's Winter Festivals have three primary objectives to celebrate and showcase our unique culture and creativity at home and across the globe, to boost tourism and the visitor economy and to engage communities and enhance national pride. Since their introduction, the Winter Festivals have gone from strength to strength. The 13-14 events programme recorded a total footfall of 250,000, and an uh, that's an 8% increase in the previous year. Over the 2014 period, we're investing around uh, £500,000 in Scotland's Winter Festivals. This is supporting a series of 18 funded events across 12 local authority areas. Events include the Open Winter Festival, which included over 50 events set around St Andrew's Day, and Haggis, Beasts and Tatties, a celebration of Burns at the Eden Court Theatre in Inverness. Marketing and promotion of the Winter Festivals is led by the Scottish Government with support from Visit Scotland. Initial evidence from our most recent St Andrew's Day celebrations um, shows that the Winter Festivals are on course to, to deliver another great success. Uh, for example, there was a fantastic response to the historic Scotland celebration of St Andrew's Day with 35,000 free tickets provided for 35 sites across the country, including Edinburgh Castle and Lithgow Palace and the Border Abbeys. And the Saltire Festival in East Lothian from the 24th to the 30th of November was also very successful. The race day at Musselburgh Racecourse attracted a crowd of more than 1,500 and uh, the Feast and Folk gave locals and, and visitors the chance to enjoy traditional music and a delicious Scottish menu at more than 14 bars and restaurants in the area. And to encourage people to join the celebration of St Andrew's Day, we've again recruited a range of private sector organisations to offer free or discounted vouchers to attractions across Scotland. So in 2014, 127 organisations signed up to be um, day out partners and in total we reached out to around uh, 270 partners celebrating St Andrew's Day, including the Scottish Book Trust and Scottish Opera. So all this uh, is evidence of exceptional partner collaboration, uh, providing visitors and communities an opportunity to sample many of Scotland's attractions and also the fantastic natural larder for which we are renowned across the world. And presiding officer, talking of Scotland's larder, as suggested by Jamie McGregor during a previous St Andrew's Day debate, I'm also delighted to see our fish and our fish dishes now being showcased on or around 30th of November to reflect St Andrew the Fisherman. Moving on to Hogmanay, Edinburgh's Hogmanay a key element of the Winter Festivals is supported from a funding contribution over £100,000 uh, from the Winter Festivals and £200,000 from the Scottish Government's Expo Fund. It's a great success story. It generates £32 million for the Scottish economy, reaches almost 1 billion people in 200 countries across the globe, and in the 1415 Hogmanay it attracted over 120,000 people over three days. And of course, uh, the Edinburgh event is one of the many highlights of Scotland's Hogmanay. It sits alongside a wealth of other events right across the country in or around 31st of December, and including, for example, the Hogmanay concert in Stornoway, which was a sellout, and the wider festival programme attracted over 500 people there. 
And of course, we're housing new and innovative events, celebrating Scotland's culture during the Hogmanay celebration, uh, building on the success of 2014. On the 1st of January 2015, Scott Lands invited audiences to come to the homeland at the National Museum of Scotland to begin a journey around 10 atmospheric venues in Edinburgh's old town, each curated and customised by notable Scottish artists and arts organisations from all over Scotland, um, supported by the Expo Fund. Uh, and let me take a moment to look at the three key aims uh, of the Winter Festivals. Firstly, the Winter Festivals aim to enhance uh, the celebration of Scotland's unique culture and creativity and also boost our international profile. Uh, St Andrew's Day is celebrated across the globe with events in Singapore, Istanbul, Rome and Montreal, for example. China, we had uh, five million people viewing the topic page in one of China's most popular media channels, uh, Sina Weibo. Um, in order to also promote uh, Scotland, we've managed to showcase truly world events across the country and making sure that our cutting edge culture and creativity is being showcased on or around the 31st of December. And there were unique music showcasing uh, events in Edinburgh, Aberdeen and Inverness and open to name but a few. Second aim is to boost tourism. The Winter Festival's programme is positioned alongside other initiatives to, to ensure that Scotland offers a wide range of uh, exciting and in inspirational events right across the country uh, throughout the year. So it shouldn't be seen in isolation the Winter Festival's programme started off and brought to a close 2014, which of course was a momentous year for our country. Uh, we celebrated homecom homecoming in spectacular style. I saw the hugely successful uh, Commonwealth Games with a very strong cultural programme, uh, very much part and parcel of the partnership um, that takes place uh, driving that. And I, I will be interested to hear what Liz Smith says, but uh, I'm very focused that the success of our events and Winter Festivals in particular is the partnership um, that we have with many of the organisations. It's not top-down uh, top driven and it's important that we reflect people in place. Great year last year was international events like the Ryder Cup and the MTV Europe Music Awards uh, certainly put us on the global stage. And looking across 2014, uh, we can also see how the Winter Festivals programme, along with all the other uh, events, helps include uh, uh, the promotion of Scotland as somewhere to visit all year round, inspiring our visitors and communities to be part of all of Scotland's brilliant moments. We're looking forward, of course, now to 2015, uh, the fantastic launch programme of the Year of Food and Drink, uh, and that started on 1st of January. Again, a great opportunity to show, showcase Scotland all year round. The Winter Festivals uh, aim also to boost national pride, to enhance community engagement and empowerment. I want to particularly focus on, on one element. I, I, I was delighted to attend the finale of the Multicultural Homecoming Celebration on the 30th of November last year. The programme was a partnership between Bemis and the Scottish Government, inviting Scotland's multicultural communities to celebrate homecoming. And it included over 40 different events across the country, uh, attracting over 6,500 people. It was a great way to celebrate Scotland in the modern uh, Scotland that we have, all the different cultures that form our modern Scotland. And the finale event was held on St Andrew's Night, uh, and we had uh, spectacular celebrations with a range of exceptional performances reflecting all the different communities here in Scotland. And it was very clear to me that our multicultural communities are keen to celebrate home and St Andrew's Day in their own particular way but to share it in an open and inclusive way and looking towards 2015 and beyond this is something we will work with Bemis to build on. Uh, boosting our unique culture and our creative sectors um, has become a key part of what we do and our winter festivals provides a, a key element to our year-round programme. And in going forward, I'm keen that we build on that momentum. Uh, we undertake planning for 15-16 with my officials uh, and we'll be undertaking a review of the winter festival strategy to ensure in keeping with our programme for government that all that can be done is being done to ensure that we can help boost local economies, encourage greater community participation on the events that are on offer. Uh, we'll also look about how we can broaden and include different activities in perhaps our more remote and rural areas. So I, I do welcome ideas and suggestions that members might have for boosting the Winter Festivals going forward, building on today's debate. And, uh, Presiding Officer, in closing, I'd like to thank all of the communities, the organisations, and the businesses and other partners who've worked so hard to make Scotland's Winter Festivals a great success story. I look forward to building on our impressive achievements as we progress towards 2015 and beyond. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. I now call on Claire Baker to speak to move the amendment number 11976.2. The Speaker, seven minutes. 
Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, this afternoon's debate gives us the opportunity to recognise the diversity of celebrations and festivals that take place in Scotland over the winter months. Um, I would like us to take a moment to reflect on the tragic accident in George Square in the run-up to Christmas, and our thoughts are with those who lost loved ones in the midst of Christmas festivities. It was heartbreaking to see families experiencing shock and loss at this time of year, and I wish all who were injured a full recovery. Uh, we again saw Glasgow having to pull together as a city to deal with a difficult time, and it showed the importance of community which lies at the heart of that city. Um, Presiding Officer, while St Andrew's Day in November to Burns Night later this month are the focus of the official Winter Festivals programme, for many Halloween and Bonfire Nights mark the start of the many exciting opportunities to gather and celebrate through the dark months. A Winter Festival is not always about a big gathering, but it's also about the community-led celebrations which mark our winter months. They all play an important role in our lives, supporting our local and national economies, boosting the tourist trade and promoting Scotland as a year-round destination and showcasing and sharing some of the best of Scotland's rich culture. Winter festivals are growing in popularity in recent years and are increasingly seen as an important part of community life. Scotland is a northern country and as our days get shorter, winter festivals do provide a focus for celebration and entertainment. Uh, the Winters Festivals programme, which is delivered and supported by Events Scotland, promotes the landmark cultural days through major events. A wide range of ticketed and free events encouraging participation are offered. There needs to be an appropriate balance between the commercial aspect of the events while recognising how important this is to their viability and also the need for inclusivity in events at this time of year, which can be expensive for many people. Uh, the figures from Visit Scotland in their briefing show the popularity and success of the festivals. Edinburgh's Hogmanay programme in particular has grown over the years and was the only festival recently listed in the Discovery Channel's Top 25 World Travel Experiences, which is pretty impressive. Anyone who comes to the city at this time of year is increasingly spoilt for choice over what to do. And while the big events remain the focus, we are increasingly seeing innovative and imaginative events spring up. Now in its third year, Scotland's, as the Cabinet Secretary said, takes audiences on a treasure-like hunt through New Year's Day through a series of venues in the Old Town, staging music, dance, film and more. While there is a focus on our cities, which are the key tourism destinations, winter festivals do give opportunities to encourage people to go further afield. The St Andrew's Day celebration in St Andrew's this year attracted almost 10,000 people to the town over the course of the weekend, providing a significant boost to the local economy. Um, the event for Burns Nights extends from the Big Burns Supper in Dumfries and Galloway, which is an imaginative and modern celebration of the Bard's work and has grown in recent years, to the Haggis, Beasts and Tatties event, which will be at Eden Court in Inverness. It is smart and important to highlight the events, which are uniquely Scottish. It encourages people to come here and visit us for a special experience. We need to ask, are we doing enough to promote what we have, promote and support international marketing? Uh, we read today of Scotland's export figures stalling in the final quarter, being due to a depressed European market. So we need to be flexible and recognise where future tourism markets need to grow. And to ensure continued success for our festivals and Scotland's brand in general, we need to do more. We must look at new and innovative ways to promote our unique and sought after brand across the world. I was very pleased to read yesterday that Aberdeen, Visit Aberdeen is pushing forward with plans to develop a Chinese version of their tourism website. We all know the benefits of overseas tourism to Scotland and of the strength in particular of the Chinese tourism trade. It is estimated that £125 billion is spent on overseas leisure and business by the Chinese. And to put this into some context, this is apparently on average 50% more than what is spent by Americans. And we know from recent surveys that Chinese tourists appreciate countryside, built heritage and culture. Scotland has all three in abundance, therefore we are in a prime position to benefit from their tourism. However, according to yesterday's report, only 1% of the Chinese population speak English. So multilingual websites are therefore a very important tool in promoting what we as a country have to offer to as many countries as possible. Promoting Scotland as a destination is increasingly culturally focused. Uh, we cannot rely on weather as our selling point, and as we saw um, over the holidays, the unfortunate cancellation of Stirling's Hogmanay celebrations this year due to high winds, the weather can still have a very negative impact on our, impact on our festivities. 
Winter festivals provide opportunities for businesses and activity over traditionally quieter seasons. And for example, I recently met with the Showman's Guild and the growth in winter festivals really supports their members out with their traditional summer seasons. And while the growing success of the major festivals is important, particularly in terms of tourism and the economy, smaller local festivals are increasingly are increasing and play an important part in the local economy and vibrancy of an area. They are increasingly innovative and imaginative, and with the involvement of the local authority or the Arts Trust, local groups and schools, they are often more inclusive, more collaborative and more directly engaging with the community. The Kirkcaldy Lantern Parade in the run-up to Christmas was a, was a beautiful example of community engagement with lantern making workshops so people could join the parade, a bringing of the light song specially composed for the event and a firework display. Um, is the Cabinet Secretary confident that we have an integrated strategy and that enough sport and advice is targeted to more regional and local events which may not return the big tourism figures but do provide community activity and celebration as well as supporting a domestic tourism market? We also see local festivals supporting the retail sector. Online shopping is becoming increasingly popular and town centre festivals do provide a way to broaden the experience of shopping and help keep our high streets alive, making sure they get a share of festive shopping. We need to continue to change the way we use retail and public space. And as an amendment says, I would like to recognise all the hard work of volunteers, community groups and trade associations and small businesses which do much to make these events happen. Presiding officer, this is an event, this is a debate which is followed by a debate on mental health, a huge health challenge of our times. And while that debate will no doubt attempt to address broad and complex issues, if we're talking about health and well-being, factors which underpin, course, which underpin good mental health, whether winter can be a challenging or particularly isolating time for many people. And in a small way, winter festivals or winter activity provide important and valuable opportunities for people to come together and socialise, benefit from a collective experience, and we should do all we can to support them and encourage wide participation. I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. Now call on Liz Smith to speak to and move Amendment 11976.1, up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and can I congratulate Claire Baker uh, on her uh, new appointment. May I also at this stage also move the amendment in my own name. I I'm sure we have all attended some uh, local winter festivals in recent weeks, and uh, of course we're all now looking forward to the burn season. As the Cabinet Secretary has said in her motion and provided us with excellent evidence in uh, her speech, these winter festivals are hugely important both on a national and on an international uh, scale, most especially in terms of the number of visitors that they attract, uh, the contribution uh, to the economy and of course a celebration of Scotland's unique culture. And she's absolutely right to point to the important influence that they will have in Scotland's uh, year of food and drink and various other themes in forthcoming years. You only need to look at the very impressive financial benefits of the Hogmanay season uh, to see just how important that influence actually is. But so too uh, it is important in terms of local communities. Winter festivals can often provide uh, a, a huge major uh, sort of community focus I think and some of the issues that Claire Baker has just spoken about in areas that perhaps don't always have uh, the same degree of economic and social advantages and I think it's entirely appropriate uh, to mention the vast army of volunteers as Claire Baker has done in her amendment who do so much to enhance that cultural experience in their own small town or village uh, many events and indeed would not actually happen uh, without them so I think it's the fact that we should support them in whichever part of Scotland uh, they come. Now several times in the past the cabinet secretary uh, has spoken about the intrinsic value of culture for its own sake uh, and I agree with uh, her on that comment uh, as do the majority of commentators who make it their business uh, to explore uh, Scotland's cultural activity. I think there have been some very interesting articles and papers that have been written partly over the Christmas period but just in recent uh, weeks and I've been struck by some dominant themes within these. Firstly, if the uh, referendum year uh, perhaps brought divisions within the arts world just as it did elsewhere in society, I believe it actually fired up a new intellectual debate in Scotland and I think that is uh, incredibly healthy and it's on that theme uh, where I think we can uh, look at the celebration of our winter festivals as well because I believe our artists uh, have a great deal of interesting things to say about culture just now, most especially about how the evolution of a nation's culture can only come about through healthy self-criticism and also about uh, freedom uh, of expression. And I think that's an important thing because Cabinet Secretary mentioned about ensuring that winter festivals are more accessible and meaningful for all. 
uh, and that has very much been a desired aim of our winter festivals, but I think it's a point on which we can uh, reflect on a broader issue. The one underlying theme, of course, that concerns uh, some of these financial constraints is that local authorities who are often running these festivals uh, are under fire because they sometimes have very difficult choices uh, to make about how uh, they prioritise their spending. I know some who have been criticised because they've chosen schools or social care or road spending above those of cultural bodies such as perhaps libraries and uh, museums. And we should not forget, as I'm sure the Cabinet Secretary is not in a position to forget, uh, that Creative Scotland was able to disburse uh, 90 million in its recent uh, round of funding, but the, 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 the bid uh, that came in was well in excess of 200 uh, million. And that shows the extent of what people wish to do with uh, culture. Uh, but obviously there is a danger that in some cases it will be some of the smaller ones that uh, can't be afforded. And I think that raises some issues about resources. And I think it also flags up some tensions which there are within the arts in Scotland just now, that the value of the arts for its own sake, which is so important, does not actually sit very easily sometimes with the financial management. For example, we need uh, only read some of the passionate comments within the film industry just now, or listen to some of the artists within our orchestras and choirs to know just how strongly they feel that tension. And I think that's something that uh, was very much uh, taken on board by Janet Arthur, I think it's something that's been taken on board by the Cabinet Secretary herself when Creative Scotland was trying to get over the problems that it had uh, two years ago. Um, but I think these tensions still uh, remain. I think they are real tensions. Uh, some of them uh, are financial, some of them are about economic uh, management. But I think it's an interesting time in Scot Scottish culture because people uh, have new ideas that uh, are flourishing and we have to ensure that to bring all that together we have a, a seriously coherent strategy that can have overarching themes with Should industry, close, with please. tourism, with lots of other businesses, and how that interacts. And I think that's a, an area that we have to look at, because uh, I think it's a, a real challenge for the cultural sector, and I hope the government uh, can take that very seriously. Thank you. Many thanks. Very tight for time today. Up to four minutes. Stuart Stevenson, followed by Hans Malik. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Fifty years ago, Christmas uh, for me was simply uh, when, as a student, I obtained temporary employment with the GPO, delivering a larger-than-usual postbag. We got paid off on Christmas Eve, and the regulars did the postal delivery on Christmas Day. Shops were open, newspapers and milk were delivered to the house, and my GP father had surgeries on Christmas Day. In short, there was very limited celebration when I was a youngster uh, of Christmas. Now, New Year was an entirely different matter. Uh, first footing, carrying something to drink, something to eat, something to burn, uh, was uh, what we normally took as we went to neighbours' houses to visit. Now, a great deal has changed. The focus is perhaps less now on individual action. The focus is now uh, much more on organised events. Well, let me just gently, and I say gently, tweak the, the, the tale of the Tories uh, through their amendment, because some of it is at odds with my instincts when it talks about strategies. I don't think this is about strategies at all. It's about defining uh, winter celebrations as something that happens uh, locally. Uh, we have uh, a huge uh, amount of uh, talent uh, to draw on. Perhaps uh, organising it and directing it through a strategy is not the way uh, that I would uh, see forward. I will indeed. Smith. I thank Mr Stevenson for taking the intervention. I think if we listen to what the uh, arts bodies themselves are saying, uh, they, they agree with you entirely about allowing... Uh, creativity to flourish in local areas but what they do want to see is a wider overarching strategy that brings more aspects of Scottish society together uh, to give that intrinsic value to art. How you see that's where we fundamentally disagree uh, presiding officer. Um, I don't want to bring people together I want to encourage diversity and I want to encourage local uh, community action. Now I recognize I might be a lone voice in that by the way it's not expressing a view of my political colleagues when I say that. Um, I just think that uh, this is an opportunity for individuals to enjoy themselves and communities and little groups to get together. 
We heard that 18 uh, uh, funding streams were used in the, the last year, and that's very much to be welcome, because we do need these anchor points that will attract uh, international uh, attention. But self-directed, self-organised, spontaneous celebration of the good in winter, uh, be that religious like Christmas or secular like New Year, or simply an excuse for a party in a dark night uh, with appropriate lubrication to keep the wheels turning, all of that is to be welcome. Now, the word Hogmanay is a mysterious one. It might be the Gallic uh, Ogmanay, meaning new morning, or it might, and this is my preference, be the Flemish Hogmendag, uh, which means high love day. Uh, now, I say that in particular because, of course, there's the opportunity to celebrate the old New Year, which comes in the middle of January, uh, something which I feel a particular affection to as I was born on the 15th of October. Those of a gynecological disposition will think about that carefully and work out why I say that. And my brother was born on exactly the same day, three years later, so clearly my parents shared my enthusiasm for the old New Year. Now... Drawing uh, my considerable experience of the matter, I regret the fact there was no snow this uh, winter. Not every minister in the government will agree and with me on that. Uh, but I think that uh, seeing uh, my great niece and her brother pulling a sledge in Denmark over Christmas, I felt really jealous. We have lots to celebrate in Scotland. We're doing extremely well. Let's keep it up and do even better in future. Presiding officer. Many thanks. Hans Alan Mallet to be followed by Colin Keir. Uh, thank you very much and good afternoon, Presiding Officer. I hope everyone had a good break this winter and I wish everyone a happy new year. Scotland Winter Festivals celebrate our nation's rich cultural heritage and showcase Scotland on an international stage. Scotland's Winter Festivals are a fantastic programme of events taking place across the country, incorporating three of Scotland's most celebrated days in Andrew's Day, Hogmanay and Burns Night, and to round up the year homecoming. It encourages everyone to get out and about in Scotland in the winter. There's much to be done and much goes on. As Hogmanay and St Andrew's Day are now past, we can look forward to the Burns Night events. And I look forward to my vegetarian or halal haggis as I can assure you that I enjoy them. We are a country renowned for our warm hospitality, and in 2014, we showed the world what a great country Scotland really is. These celebratory nights offer great opportunities for visitors and residents alike, and to continue the efforts from 2014 and celebrate our rich cultural and diversity around the world. In my constituency, we saw Glasgow on ice return once again in, to George Square, and it promised to be better than ever, and it certainly delivered. Glasgow on ice came alive in a celebratory of events Scotland on St Andrew's Day and has continued over the festive period. There has been skating with a Scottish twist. At the Glasgow City Council front was transformed by a light show celebrating a snapshot of Scotland throughout the night, thanks to video artists Tim Reid and playwright Jenny Knox on St Andrew's Day. I was happy to see that the busiest days in Glasgow, if you were traveling on public transport or on foot, the, the people were encouraged with various discounts and offers and given goodie bags to take home. And I can say that the children in particular enjoyed the free goodies. Uh, one idea I have to offer, as the Cabinet Secretary had suggested that she's looking for offers, is perhaps next year, during the Burn Supper events, we could try and encourage cafe shops and retail outlets to open later in the evenings. I think that would encourage a lot more activity. And I hope that one day we will see a greater, great events grow and generate retail industry and local communities, as well as for Scotland as a whole, and I look forward to hearing the reviews that we attract for the year's um, activities that have been going on. 
The Cabinet Secretary has also mentioned the fact that uh, these festivals um, uh, are not only restricted to winter, that we do rather well in Scotland throughout the year. And just to uh, give a small example of what is happening in Scotland, or particularly in Glasgow, is that we're going to have the European Judo Championships, the Turner Prize, and the British Athletics International, just to sh give a sample of what we're looking forward to seeing in Glasgow in particular. And I hope and I pray that we can not only just consolidate on what we've done so far to date, that we can actually build on the continued success that we've had. And, Presiding Officer, just to conclude, I want to say that we've seen year in, year on, that we've actually done rather well. Uh, we seem to be uh, reaching uh, levels of expertise that are renowned throughout the world. And I, I wish everybody who's participated and helped engage these issues to continue to do so in the future. Thank you very much. Many thanks. And now Colin, Colin Keir to be followed by Jane Baxter. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I wish you and the other members in the Chamber a happy new year. I'm delighted to have been called to speak at this debate heralding the success of Scotland's winter festivals. And as an Edinburgh MSP, I make no apology in using Edinburgh as a great example of a winter festival. For over 21 years, the city has welcomed the world to celebrate New Year in spectacular style at the now internationally famous Edinburgh's Hogmanay. With three days of free and ticketed events featuring headline concerts, theatre, music, dance and street party extravaganzas, and it's the re for this reason, as Claire Baker has pointed out earlier, it's the only festival recently listed in Discovery Channel's Top 25 World Travel Experiences. Initial analysis suggests that Edinburgh's Hogmanay welcomed visitors from over 70 countries, and this contrasts with visitors from 55 countries in 2013-14. The highlight of the festival, of course, was the Hogmanay Street Party, which was a sellout with over 75,000 revellers and including two ticketed events. The Concert in the Gardens with Lily Allen, which attracted 9,500 revellers, and the Cayley on the Mound, which attracted another 3,000 people. Of course, it's not just in the city centre that revellers have fun as part of this great winter festival. Add to this the additional estimated 100,000 plus people watching the midnight fireworks across the city and beyond, and on New Year's Day, a sellout of 1,000 participants braving the freezing waters of the 1st of 4th at Queen's Ferry in my constituency took part in the Looney Duke, and all viewed by an estimated 3,000 observers. Edinburgh can quite rightly claim to have had an, a highly successful winter festival. I also agree with some of the comments that Stuart Stevenson said uh, earlier on. Local traditions mer merging with modern ideas have shown that Scotland can produce events that the world wants to come and see. Anyone watching any news programme on New Year's Day would have seen the way that other countries and cities across the globe celebrate the beginning of the new year. Sydney, New York, Berlin and London, all producing spectacular events, but not necessarily producing festivals as we know them. And that's the advantage that we have here in Scotland. When we had a similar debate a few months ago, there was a reference to the City of Edinburgh Council's Thundering Hooves reports. These reports re refer how Edinburgh maintains its position as a leading arts festival in the world. And I believe Edinburgh has a world-leading winter festival, but we cannot be complacent. There is no doubt there are pressures on public finances, thanks to austerity and various other problems, and I welcome the Scottish Government funding. In my opinion, local authorities, local residents and the private sector all have to come together when organising local festivals. And whether in Edinburgh or elsewhere, in order to work on sustainable models of planning and financing these national assets, which are the winter festivals. Rather like life in general, the world doesn't owe Scotland a living. We are in competition with some huge players for the revenue that is generated by tourism. At a time of the year which can be less than pleasant, we need to take every advantage that we can muster. Our artistic talent, flair for planning our festivals, and at this point, I'd actually like to mention and congratulate Faith Little of Festivals Edinburgh on her award in the New Year's Honours list. And, of course, the ability to make these local festivals relevant to local Thank residents George, course, who enjoy the festivities as much as our visitors. Can I make two points to finish, presiding officer, but headed towards those outside the chamber? Hotel accommodation and charges in Edinburgh can be embarrassingly high at festival time compared to some of our competitors internationally. Uh, festivals won't work unless we have visitors. 
And secondly, can I say, I'd make the plea once again for a speedy devolving of air passenger duty. This would make a huge difference, not just at festival times. Scotland's a major player globally in, when close, it comes to please. festivals. Let's keep it that way. Thank you very much. I uh, now call on Jane Baxter to be followed by John McAlpine. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Today is the 12th day of Christmas, which traditionally marked the end of the period where people lit their homes and streets to dispel the dark, cold days of winter. For many, it also marks the time to take down the decorations and get back to a normal routine. Winter festivals are part of that same tradition, a way of bringing some much-needed festive cheer to the streets of Scotland. The festivals are often rooted in history and heritage, but increasingly are providing a focus for modern-day living, community activities and wider interests. Scotland has always had its share of celebrations over the winter time, from St Andrew's Day through New Year to Burns Night. Each of these obviously exists in its own right and features different events and activities. But given the increasing popularity of the events and also in recognition of the array of local, more community-based events which take place all over Scotland in the winter months, it makes sense to recognise these different celebrations and occasions as part of a branding and wider marketing exercise to celebrate our winter festivals. And in reaching out via the traditional festivals and drawing on that cultural heritage to bring in new opportunities and experiences, we see that the winter festivals form a bridge between old and new, enabling the cultural events over the season to face both ways, much like the Roman god Janus, after whom January is named, the god of beginnings and transitions and also of doorways, endings and time, looking with his two faces to the future and the past. So events like Burns Night and St Andrew's Day are rooted in Scottish tradition, but a more modern and marketable take on them ensures a focus on economic development and the continued growth of Scotland's popularity as a visitor destination. It also provides some excellent balance to the rest of the year and provides a counterpoint to the hugely successful cultural events and festivals which dot the calendar throughout the summer months. As a member from Scotland and Fife, I'm delighted to speak in this debate today, which draws attention to the increasingly popular St Andrew's Day celebrations. That wee town in East Nuka Fife is world famous for so many reasons, and it's great to see that there is growing celebration of its namesake and an international recognition of what it means to be Scottish. I note that the 2014 celebrations in St Andrews on 30th November took that Scottish identity and celebrated all aspects of it, from influences from the past through to the present, whether through Irish dancing, Bangra beats, or a pipe band parade in a Cayley in the evening. And if you look at other events which make up the winter festival season, not only is international appeal so evident, for example, in our world-famous celebration of Hugmanay, which attracts visitors from across the globe, but also in increasing participation from local residents or UK-based tourists on a staycation and choosing to have a city break, not in Berlin or Paris or Amsterdam, but in Scotland's cities and major towns. But there can be a criticism that many of the events which have developed over the past few years, particularly around the festive period, are costly and add an extra financial burden to the pockets of parents which are already overstretched at Christmas time. So initiatives such as those which have been developed in Edinburgh, where residents with a local postcode were eligible for discounted entry to attractions, are to be welcomed and, I hope, further developed. Similarly, in Dunfermline, the Winter Festival organised by Dunfermline Delivers was designed to attract local residents and visitors and in so doing provide a boost to local businesses. Visitors to the city over the festive period were also able to check out the new businesses, given the chance to trade in the town centre from 14th November until 24th December in the town's Venture Street competition. From arts and crafts to fashion and food, there was a diverse and appealing mix of businesses which drew people to the area and also saw budding entrepreneurs given rent-free premises to run their own business and the chance to win a support package worth up to £85,000 for starting place. a new business in Dunfermline. So in conclusion, presiding officer, winter festivals continue to demonstrate their appeal as a celebration of our traditional culture, a major factor in attracting visitors and a boost to local economies. All of this alongside their no less important role as a way of providing fun and entertainment and a chance for families to do things together, which are all things we perhaps don't value enough in our busy modern world. Thank you. Many thanks. And I call on Joan McAlpine to be followed by Elaine Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also start by wishing yourself and other members of the Chamber a Happy New Year? Uh, it seems particularly appropriate that we are celebrating Scotland's winter festivals right at the beginning of 2015 which is, of course, UNESCO's International Year of Light. 
UNESCO has the UN's cultural arm, um, and in 2015 it will stage events around the globe to highlight the central role light plays in human activities. But of course, there is nothing new under the sun, even the thin winter sun. Light was accorded just as much importance by our ancestors who celebrated the winter solstice to brighten the cold months when daylight was scarce, and our Scottish winter festivals have their origins in that time. The UNESCO blog on the subject this week points out that on a fundamental level through photosynthesis, light is necessary to the existence of life itself. It has revolutionised society through medicine, communications, entertainment and culture. And for this reason, the Nobel Prize this year will have light as its theme. But it's not just Nobel laureates who will contribute to the UNESCO's global celebrations. In Dumfries this coming Burns Night, as part of the Big Burns Supper Winter Festival, 2,000 children will also celebrate the Year of Light with a spectacular carnival. Uh, each will carry a glittering lantern uh, and the parade will trace a journey to the centre of the earth through the centre of Dumfries. Uh, I have to say it does not seem like a year since I led a members debate in the chamber celebrating the Big Burn Supper in Dumfries, which has become the premier Burns event in the Winter Festival's calendar. Despite only being launched in 2012, the Big Burn Supper has gone from strength to strength and I'm particularly heartened to hear that it was rewarded a 30,000 grant this year from Event Scotland. This year's festival has been extended to nine days and includes everything from Nina Nisbet and the undertones to the contrasting Burns Tea Dance and Burlesque Burns Supper Le Haggis. There are very special treats after the Burns Night Parade when regular music and NTS collaborate on Janis Joplin Full Tilt which has been described by one reviewer as brilliant and intense. And there are dozens of events in the emerging talent strand of the festival, far too many to list in the time available. But I would like to highlight the work of a young woman called Robin Stapleton. Uh, she's a local girl from Stranraer and a graduate of the Conservatoire of Scotland's traditional music course. And she will be singing as part of the emerging talent uh, program. Robin has a stunning voice and she seems set to become a leading burn singer for the future generation. She has spent her final year at the Conservatoire researching and reviving the traditional music of her native Mullen Galloway and uh, if anyone gets the opportunity uh, to hear her sing I would very much urge them to do so. Uh, this year the Big Burn Supper Festival has extended its community involvement and this might be of interest to those members who, who raised the importance of arts at a local level. Uh, the Big Burn Supper has launched a festival within a festival in North West Dumfries, that's the areas of Lincluden and Loch Side. And this is an outreach programme aimed at involving residents of what is a low income area uh, in the festival. Eight acts, including the award-winning Scary Vore Folk Rock Band and the Canadian vocal group Countermeasure, will put on free pop-up shows in the area and there will also be performances of the very popular Hamish the Haggis children's show and, and much more which is still to be announced. When I spoke about the Big Burn Supper last year I pointed out that it was really special because Dumfries itself is a living stage, it's the, sta it's the same place where Burns Could lived and worked. Close, please? Thank you. Um, and you can visit the same pubs that he drank in and indeed the house that he lived in. Similarly, the people of Dumfries and North West Dumfries uh, have a direct connection to the people and places who inspired the Bard. They speak in the same language as him and have the same humanitarian values. Um, so therefore, I would say this is an excellent development of one of our most successful winter festivals. Excellent. And I'm very delighted to highlight it in this debate today. Thank you very much. Many thanks. Dr Lane Murray to be followed by Roderick Campbell. Thank you, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, and may I wish everybody a happy new year also. Uh, winter festivals, as others have said, contribute to national and local economies, uh, but they do a lot more than that. Uh, as others have said, they also contribute to our well-being. In northern countries like ours at this time of year, the nights are long, the sun, when it does appear, doesn't rise much above the horizon, many of the trees are bare, uh, and the plants have died back. It is apposite, I think, that mental health is also being debated uh, this afternoon, uh, as the depth of winter is often particularly hard for sufferers for conditions such as a depression and seasonal affective disorder. The social benefits uh, of winter festivals were probably understood long before their economic opportunities. And as others have said, many cultures over many millennia have celebrated festivals of light, bringing people together to celebrate a common culture. 
The Druids and others celebrated the winter, winter solstice, and it has been argued that Pope Julius I in the 4th century AD decreed that the birth of Christ should be celebrated at that time, uh, partly to prevent people from continuing to uh, celebrate uh, pagan festivals. And in Scotland, of course, we have continued to celebrate New Year as a separate festival from, from Christmas. The Celts didn't only celebrate the solstices and equinoxes. They also celebrated quarter, quarter days in four fire festivals. So in at the beginning of October, which was the precursor of Halloween, and marked the start of the dark half of the year, and Beltane at the beginning of May, uh, which started the light half of the year. In between these felt Lammas around the end of July, and interestingly, a number of the common ridings actually had to take place around about that sort of time, and Imolk at the end of January. Imolk is now celebrated in other parts of the Celtic world as St Bridget's Day, However, here in Scotland, we have the good fortune that our national bard was born at the end of January uh, and giving us the opportunity of more cultural celebration at that time of year. Uh, and as we know, the Burns supper season stretches out throughout February. And although Robert Burns spent time in Edinburgh and the Highlands, he lived and worked first in Ayrshire and then in Dumfrieshire and his Burns country, uh, which I think has the greatest potential benefit uh, from these celebrations. That potential for Dumfries, where Burns died and is buried in St Michael's Church, was recognised, as Joseph McAlpine has already said today, and I think both she and I have also celebrated in previous debates, uh, a very enterprising group of people in 2011 who launched the Big Burns Supper to coincide with the weekend of Burns Night in 2012. That was only three years ago, and it seems quite extraordinary because it seems to have been on our calendar for a lot longer than that. The success of this very modern and eclectic celebration of the life of Robert Burns is demonstrated by his expansion after only three festivals from a long weekend event to a nine-day event, which now involves 100 shows in 50 venues and a Burns Night car Carnival involving over 2,000 people from Dumfries and Galloway, Galloway. The wonderful Spiegel Tent will be in town again, hosting a variety of acts, comedy, cabaret, music from, uh, ranging from folk to heavy metal, and as John McAlpine said, and I said in an earlier debate, the burlesque, the, the Haggis Burns Supper, uh, which I didn't dare to attend last year, but many people must have uh, attended it because it was actually going to be running for a week this year. Now, I do know that many of the organisers were on the other side of the referendum debate to myself. That may mean that I'm less welcome uh, at the events, but it makes no difference to my appreciation of the work they put in to ensure the success of the festival and its including importance to the region. And I hope, actually, this year's festival will help to heal some of the divides in the community too. Scotland is often depicted as a country where there are four seasons, all of which are rainy. That may well be true. However, our seasons are very distinct in terms of the amount of daylight, and I think that can be turned to our advantage by the promotion of seasonal festivals which celebrate that particular aspect uh, of our northerly part uh, of this globe. Thanks. I now call on Roderick Campbell, after which we'll move to closing speeches. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to take part in this debate on Scotland's winter festivals, and like other members, I welcome uh, the, this new year and wish all members a happy new year. While reflecting on the success of the events, I would also like to take the chance to consider the opportunities the hosting of such events provides, not just, as Stuart Stevenson implied, a party on a dark night, nor indeed possibly the opportunities for procreation that he implied. At a local level, I'm particularly pleased to have the privilege of representing an area that held one of the first events of this programme. I speak, of course, about the four-day celebration that took place in St Andrews around St Andrews Day which Claire Baker has already referred to. For a town with a population of approximately 9,000 pounds, 9,000 people, not including the student population, or approximately 16,700, including students, to accommodate some 2,000 spectators for their final day of activities, including performances by performers such as Edie Ryder, together with the switching on of the town's Christmas lights is impressive, to say the least. Whilst I have no doubt that the celebrations in St Andrews would have been an excellent success, regardless of whether or not additional funding from the government had been provided, I am sure that their share of the 315,000 has been gratefully received. St Andrews has for a very long time been a popular tourist destination, but it requires continued investment and attention to ensure that that success continues. The town is sometimes referred to as the jewel in the crown of Fife and is a haven for many foreign and domestic tourists, particularly golfers. To that extent, for the town and the surrounding area, events such as the St Andrew's Day celebrations are something of a bonus, but a very useful addition to the local economy and something that the local economy needs to keep ticking over. The celebrations in St Andrew's, of course, also encompass the St Andrew's Food and Drink Festival, 
helping to promote the local food and drink sector even further. As we all know, St Andrews, like so many places in North East Fife, has an excellent uh, reputation for top quality food and drink. Viewers of the most recent BBC series of MasterChef will know what I'm talking about, with the winner of the 2014 series, Jamie Scott, an Arbroath man but working at the Rocker in St Andrews, and the runner-up in, in the 2013 series, Scott Davis, being a chef at the town's Adamson restaurant. In addition, two chefs from the Fairmont Hotel just outside St Andrews have also featured in two recent finals. So we've got quite a reputation for food and drink. Scotland's winter festivals are therefore not just a series of events in their own right, they also act as an advert for that Scotland's year of food and drink, and an opportunity for those areas hosting events to showcase themselves for the year ahead. I'm certain that my constituency will be up there with the best of them, with its fine history of being a purveyor of good food and drink. I uh, also uh, hope that St Andrews will reaffirm its excellent reputation as a tourist destination in time for the Open Golf Championship later this year. Presiding officer, if I may, I'd like to conclude on some statistics. Information from the Scottish Government show that attendance at cultural events and places reached 89.6% of the adult population in 2012, which is the most recent data available. This includes attendance at places such as libraries, live music events, cinemas and theatres. And in that respect, I'm pleased that attendance at cultural events in the town may just increase further this year following the successful reopening of the Bar Theatre in the uh, late, latter part of 2014, following a deal being reached with the university. Presiding officers, Scotland's winter festivals helped to close 2014, but I'm sure that the festival events still to take place will help kick off 2015 with a bang. Indeed, Burns Night is almost on us, and I'm sure this is eagerly awaited in Dumfries and elsewhere. Thank you, presiding officer. Many thanks, and we now move to closing speeches, and I call on Cameron Buchanan. Four minutes, please, <coughs> Mr Buchanan. Thank you, presiding officer. It's always welcome to hear about the cultural successes throughout our Scotland, and our winter festivals have done us proud once more. All manners of parties, celebrations, and traditional festivals have been held the length and breadth of this country. With, local, with the local communities benefiting greatly, I will first of all say that a lot is fantastic. First of all, say that it's fantastic to hear such great, such unanimous praise for the deserving performers and organisers. Praise for the, for the deserve. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Praise for the deserving performers and organisers. However, this Parliament must also use these debates to focus attention on what needs to be done on, to build on these successes. More could be done by the Scottish Government to support our winter festivals, which is why we Scottish Conservatives have submitted an amendment calling for a coherent arch strategy to boost our cultural rep reputation. Before explaining further why I believe this Chamber should support Ms Smith's motion, I feel strongly that the invaluable contribution of the Hogmanay Festival to Edinburgh's life deserves recognition and further congratulations. As a resident of Edinburgh and as an MSP for Lothian, I understand very well how much the annual festivities mean to our wonderful city. We are extremely proud of our multi-day festival, which is one of the kind and very grateful to all who are involved. Around 70,000 people attended in 2013. And tickets sold out for the street party very, very quickly. That was just last week. It obviously delivers a great boost to Edinburgh's economy and the whole of Scotland's economy, with estimates for the previous years nearing £30 million. On this note, if the Scottish Government could provide a figure for the contribution of the Hogmanay Festival 2014 and 15 to the Edinburgh economy, it would be very useful. Although I would enjoy going on here to touch on events such as the Burns Fest in Edinburgh, I will use this opportunity to look at what should be done going forward. The amendment submitted in Miss Smith's name highlights what is clear to many people. Our arts and, and creative industries need a fully coherent strategy set out by the Scottish Government to... Uh, sorry, set out by the Scottish Government... There are a large number of fantastic cultural successes of which we can be proud, including winter festivals of which this is, which is which are being held this season. However, this Parliament needs to discuss aspects of Scotland's cultural scene where, regrettably, things are not working as well as they should, and more money could be done to help them. We do not have the time and, and um, more in, in this debate to enter into the details of where specific organisations have struggled. But it appears that both Creative Scotland and the film industry, to name a few, could benefit from a clearer arts strategy. As my colleague touched upon earlier, arts bodies of all shapes and sizes across the country should be provided with integrated support, 
and funding priorities that will enable them to move more easily to reach their full potential. Without such a system in place, some of the wealth of cultural talent we have in this country may be lost. I'm sure we can all agree that such a loss of talent is always a great shame. According to presiding officer, I hope that Scotland continues to deliver fantastic winter festivals and all of our creative industries can strive to strengthen our well-earned reputation as one of the best countries for arts to flourish. Gosh, sorry. In order for this to happen, they need a fully coherent art strategy and they need it as soon as possible. I therefore all, uh, urge all of my fellow members to support the amendment in Smith Smith's name. Thank you. Thanks. I now call on Anne McTaggart. Six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer, and Happy New Year to all. Um, I'm delighted to be closing today's debate on behalf of Scottish Labour on winter festivals. And, President Officer, as a mother of three dear children, winter festivals are something my family gets involved in every year in my hometown of Glasgow. Let me start, though, by saying that Scotland has a strong record and an invaluable reputation on arts participation. We are a host to world-class events such as the Ryder Cup and the Commonwealth Games, which attracted hundreds of thousands of visitors to Scotland and promoted our image as a proud country on an international stage. There is no doubt that Scotland plays a host to an impressive list of events and festivals during the winter months, as we've heard from this debate. Our winter festivals, which begin with the celebration of St Andrew's Day on the 30th of November and Hug Marie celebrations on the 31st of December, culminating with Burns Night on the 25th of January, celebrate Scotland's rich culture and creativity and welcome locals and tourists for celebrations in many local and community organised winter festivals across the country. We know that in 2013-14, Winter Festival's programme attracted over 250,000 people from the Highlands to Dumfries and Galloway, and participation in these fe festivals are growing every year. My colleague, Hans Alamalik Malik, mentioned um, Glasgow on the ice and reminded us about skating with a Scottish twist. And it's even bigger and even better than in previous years but I didn't actually hear him disclose if he'd been on it or not. But anyway, I'm sure we'll hear about that later. And Jane Baxter identified the celebrations of St Andrew's Day in Fife and the importance of that, which marks the start of the Winter Festival celebrations. And it is not only celebrated in Scotland, but events are hosted all around the world to mark Scotland's National Day. Presiding officer, I believe everyone will agree with me that no one celebrates Hugmanay like as the Scots. We got it from all traditional, we, we, we got it all from traditional fire festivals and torchlight processions to street parties with live music and firework displays. Joan McAlpine and Elaine Murray identified the celebrations of the Big Burns Supper in Dumfries, which we have yet to look forward to. This marks the world's biggest celebration of Scotland's national poet, Robert Burns. His work created an enduring legacy for the nation's art and culture, which continues to define its cultural heritage. We in Scottish Labour fully appreciate and understand that the excellence in arts has its own intrinsic value, but that its power can be used to drive change throughout our society. Although it's inspiring to know that so many people engage in cult cultural and winter festivals, I am sure my colleagues here will agree with me that we need to address the fact that people in our most deprived communities still participate less in cultural activities and are therefore isolated from the benefits that they bring. If we look at the... Yes, certainly. Galpine for taking an intervention. Just on the topic of, of arts funding, uh, yesterday morning the Labour press team sent out a tweet saying page 44 of the Tory dossier says Labour will cancer, cancel cuts to the arts budget. We won't. A number of artists have uh, expressed concern that Labour seem to be boasting that they're going to cut the arts budget and I wondered whether she would want to distance herself from that comment by UK Labour. 
I appreciate um, Joan McAlpine's interve intervention, but I think it's important that we concentrate on what's happening here within the Scottish Government budget as opposed to elsewhere and, and really in blame elsewhere. Presiding officer, if we look at the Scottish index of multiple deprivation, of those adults living in the most deprived 20%, only 68% will have participated in cultural activity in the last 12 months, compared to 87% in the least deprived 20%. With Scottish Labour invest, investment in cultural activities, we made entry to museums and galleries free so that everyone could enjoy our nation's history, heritage and culture. We should ensure that our winter festivals hold more free events in order for more people from deprived areas to benefit from these festivals during the winter months in their local communities. In conclusion, President Officer, I believe that people from communities across Scotland benefit hugely from winter festivals events as mentioned in this debate. Winter festivals attract tourists and boost economy thereafter. I am also proud that we as a nation are able to host such an extensive range of winter festivals throughout the length and breadth of the country, which provide a great opportunity for visitors and residents to celebrate our unique culture and distinctive heritage. And I am sure my colleagues will join me in commending the extensive work of the volunteers, local groups and small businesses that contribute to making the success of these festivals. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Cabinet Secretary Fiona Hislop to wind up the debate. Eight minutes, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, it's been a very enjoyable debate, and I do want to try and address a number of the points that were raised during the debate. Um, I agree with the amendment from Claire Baker, and I appreciate her points about community, uh, in particular, and local festivals. I'm not sure I agree with the idea of extending winter to start at Halloween. I think it's too long and dark as it is. But important points that she made was uh, about local festivals, and she mentioned Kirkcaldy. Um, Town centre festivals are important from a retail point of view, whether it's uh, during winter or at other points. And I have been working with Derek Mackay formerly, now it'll be Marco Biagi, on, on the town centre uh, regeneration, town centre plan, and how actually culture uh, will form part and parcel of uh, how we can make sure that there is vibrant life in our town centres. She also talked about the need for wider promotion. She talked about China. I mentioned the, the, the references that we've already had in terms of our, um, our reach. A lot of bookings, uh, tourist bookings, are still on a group basis. So we have to promote on a group basis as well as individually. Uh, but one of the new innovations, and we always have to innovate, is Blogmoney, which was about bringing the world's bloggers to Edinburgh during Hogmanay to, for them to experience that, to tell other people to generate more interest. And I think that's a good example of being uh, innovative in that regard. I want to address Liz Smith's uh, um, points. I appreciate her arguments. I don't agree with her amendment, but I understand where she's coming from. In terms of um, what we need to, to address, in terms of balancing uh, the expression of Scotland in the modern day, and she's absolutely right, the generation of the intellectual thought that came out um, of the last year is something that won't go away. We want to make sure it doesn't go away. We want to embrace it, but to do so in an inclusive way, I think um, has, has merit in terms of how we see this, um, this argument of the wider issue of arts and culture. I think it would be wrong to say that the winter festivals haven't been successful in an absence of a, a national art strategy, precisely because of all the arguments that have been made about the spontaneity of place, the connection with place, the partnerships, the local character of many of our festivals. But the point she was making about there somehow being some tension between the intrinsic value of art and financial um, art in terms of financial aspects of what can be generated... I think the real challenge for Scotland, and I think it's one that we can bridge, is this not being an either-or uh, argument. It can be a both-and-and argument. Now, why do I say that? Well, I'll let the member give in. I'll give an example. Mr. Smith. Secretary, I think we're broadly on the same theme. One of the examples that I think is particularly pertinent just now is what the film industry is saying, that it can't do some of the things it would like to do without the help, of, for example, of the broadcasting industry or of some uh, related tourist industry, and it's to try to get that into a unified structure. That's really the point. Absolutely. Well, the integration that is required, and that, I know there's a committee looking into this issue. I don't think Cameron Buchanan is familiar with Creative Scotland's film strategy, but I'm happy to send it to him. But her, her point about 
everybody working together um, is something that we've done extremely well, particularly over recent years, but particularly in the last year, when we brought together Visit Scotland and we've got Event Scotland to start Scotland, Creative Scotland, in terms of how we coordinate what we do. Also, I chair um, the uh, causal group that brings all the arts and, and culture conveners from across Scotland for the first time to address some of the opportunities and challenges. But going back to my point about how we can have a society in Scotland that values intrinsic, the intrinsic uh, merits of art, but also the financial aspect. Let's take the example of the Big Burn Supper in Defrees. The Big Burn Supper in Defrees that was um, spoken about by Joe McAlpine and Elaine Murray, you know, it's not easy art or safe art. It's actually great art and ambitious art. But what we've also heard is it's now nine days, it's generating great opportunity and finance for the local community. So you can actually embrace both. But I also want to, to reflect on Stuart Stevenson's points as well. Although before I get to that, I think I'll talk about the intellectual debate rather than the social debate that he grew on to. The point about trying to embrace that, the salt of society reinvigorated is precisely using the St Andrew's um, opportunities to have that type of debate. We deliberately had the Scottish Book Week in that first period, that first week of the Winter Festivals, because it is a time for Scotland to reflect, to read, to think about the arguments. So I think there is merit in some of the arguments that she was making. I just don't think this is the right debate or indeed the context in relation to the festivals to think about that positioning. But I'm happy to take that debate forward um, as 2015 progresses. Stuart Stevenson talked about the importance of having diversity. I agree with him. Spontaneous celebration. I can confess that I was celebrating spontaneously with my teenage daughter's friends dancing to a delayed recording of Jules Holland's TV programme, Hootenanny. You can do it with modern music. You can do it um, in, in different ways. But also reflecting what Scotland is. Some of the music that's been showcased at our winter festival is fantastic. Scotland, as we talked about, was actually first footing of 10 different venues, but by different audiences coming to Scotland. The wonderful Kenny Anderson's From Scotland With Love was a, a fantastic showcase at the Commonwealth Games, but again was shown again as part of um, the Hogmanay celebrations of the 1st um, of January, which is again is supported by the Scottish Government. So I do think that we have to have authenticity, and I think the bridge that I can perhaps divide between Stuart Stevenson's comments and those that are talking about structured events is actually what have we got that not other, no other country in the world probably has is the authenticity of celebration of St Andrews, Hogmanay and also Burns Night in a way that no, nobody else has. But it's got to be based on that energy and that uh, participation and that also that authenticity that lies at the heart of our tourist offer. Um, in terms of um, other points, Colin Keir quite right to talk about not being complacent. Uh, APD, absolutely, we need to have that as quickly as possible. You've seen the advantages that can provide. Also, real problems in tackling that. Uh, I think a big difference it would make to our tourist industry. So there are practical things we have to do as well as creative points as well. And Jane Baxter and also Rod Campbell talked about uh, St Andrews and um, the, the diversity and the range of celebrations that were there. In terms of looking forward, we have burns still to come in terms of our celebrations. And as a girl from Alloway, as the presiding officer, well knows. Um, I want to make sure that we can celebrate that in style. Uh, there's over £45,000 uh, allocated to support five events. Um, the Haggis Beats, Beasts and Tatties event in Inverness, the Big Burn Supper in De Fries and Galway, Burns Fest at the Scottish Storytelling Centre, Burns Unbound at the National Museum of Scotland, and of course the inspirational Robert Burns Humanitarian Awards um, in Alloway itself. So visit Scotland's website, uh, it shows events that are happening all over Scotland. I would encourage people to look at that. Uh, looking forward, we have Celtic Connections uh, from 15th of January to the 1st of February, uh, one of the largest music festivals of its kind carving a global reputation. In 2014, um, uh, Celtic Connections was boosted by Homecoming. Uh, they had 2,100 artists, 300 events, 20 venues, and of course, up here are in, in Lerwick, going back to that theme of celebrating with fire and light. And going forward, uh, we've got the celebrations of uh, food and drink, which again will have creative opportunities. And also, if we look ahead, if we can marshal, and I think that's the key thing, point, marshal all our resources, all our enthusiasm, all of the talents of Scotland, we can look forward to the themed years that are going forward, the 2016 year of innovation, architecture, design, 2017 year of history, heritage and archaeology, 2018 year of young people, all based on a country that can deliver authentic celebrations uh, from our winter festivals to celebrations throughout the year and in the years going forward. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And that concludes the debate on winter festivals and it's now time to move on to the next item of business which is a debate on motion number 11975 in the name of Jamie Hepburn 
on mental health. I invite those members who wish to speak in this debate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And uh, Mr Hepburn, when you are ready, and since you're on your feet, if you are ready, we could kick off. You have ten minutes, please. Uh, I was nearly uh, ready, uh, President Officer. Can I uh, uh, say uh, at the outset, given it is the first uh, occasion in which I have uh, had to do so, unless I forget later, can I move the motion uh, in uh, my name? President Officer, I uh, welcome uh, this opportunity, my first as the Minister with Responsibility for Mental Health, to debate the matter of improving Scotland's mental health. I know that members will uh, join me in welcoming uh, this opportunity, opportunity to cover this important matter, particularly this time of year, minds turn to doing better and to renewing uh, resolutions. And let me set out at the outset, President Officer, that one of my resolutions is to do all I can uh, to ensure that we see improved mental health in our uh, country. Uh, President Officer, as the First Minister of any Scottish Government to have mental health explicitly uh, stated in their ministerial title, I hope that this gives some indication uh, as to the importance in which this administration uh, places in improving Scotland's mental health. Of course, it will be in our efforts, we shall be uh, rightly judged, and I hope to set out some of that over the course of the next 10 uh, minutes or so. It is also uh, the case that the Government is taking forward a mental health bill at this time, seeking to refine and improve the system that we have in place to ensure people with a mental health disorder can access effective treatment quickly and easily. I hope that this in itself gives some indication of the importance that we are placing on the area of mental health. That bill will rightly be subject to debate on its own merits at another time, but I would like to briefly take this opportunity to thank the Health and Sport Committee for their efforts in scrutinising the bill thus far and say I am looking forward to reading their Stage 1 report in due course. Uh, President Officer, in this uh, opening contribution, I will aim to cover some key issues today about illness, about recovery uh, and about stigma. I will speak about, about what we have done and how we are doing and set out the progress that we are making across uh, Scotland. I will speak about what we will do next to focus on the challenges before us. Challenges members may be familiar with from discussions with constituents. Uh, mental health is, of course, a subject that touches us all, whether we have a mental health problem, whether we are a carer for someone who has a mental health problem, or whether we have family, friends or colleagues who have had a mental health problem. Mental illness is one of the top public health challenges, not just here in Scotland, but across Europe as a whole, where it is estimated that mental health disorders affect more than a third of the population every Year. And yet, despite it being such a common human experience, too often people might not always admit to their closeness to a mental illness. A person might be unwilling to mention a spell of illness, the time they needed antidepressants, the time they required therapy. They might be reluctant to mention that they take medication daily to control symptoms. They might shy away from asking a friend who has been down if they are OK and if they want to talk. That reluctance, that reticence, that unwillingness can come about because we expect a bad response, and that is an issue. It is one of the challenges I spoke of earlier. It is why we must continue uh, with breaking down the stigma of mental ill health. And debates uh, like these are, are key to doing just that. It is vital that this Parliament, our country's national legislature, regularly and openly debates topics uh, related to mental health. And of course, uh, our partners in the third sector uh, have a huge role uh, to play in tackling uh, stigma uh, too. I am pleased that the uh, work of organisations like Alzheimer's Scotland, uh, Penumbra and the Scottish Association for Mental Health is being recognised. The Government recognises the importance of the third sector and in 2013-14 we are providing over £1 million to numerous uh, national mental health organisations uh, to, uh, 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 towards that end. And I welcome the joint the Scottish Government Comic Relief Funding uh, for CME. As members will know, CME is Scotland's national campaign to end mental health stigma and discrimination is hosted by the Scottish Association for mental health. The Scottish Social Attitude Survey shows that the work of CME is still uh, needed with a greater emphasis on changing outcomes. People are still experiencing negative attitudes because of their mental health problem and people self-stigmatise, avoiding events and not wanting uh, to talk about their uh, illness. The refounded CME has a framework of action to take forward over the next three years with activity uh, areas based around, for example, equality and human rights, the workplace uh, settings where people experience discrimination, lived experience participation and national uh, campaigning. Uh, and there are uh, other ways we can uh, start to end uh, mental health uh, discrimination. There has been a debate around parity of mental health and physical health, and I uh, see that Mr Hume's uh, amendment uh, refers to that. Let me say I welcome 
that debate. I want to see the same focus and approach to improving mental health services as we have uh, to physical <coughs> health services. I can say, uh, President Officer, the National Health Service Scotland Act 1978 states that Scottish ministers have a duty to secure improvements in the physical and mental health of the people of Scotland. It does not distinguish between the two, and nor does it place a higher importance on one over the other. Our Scottish NHS has a duty to promote the improvement of health, a duty that extends equally to the areas of physical and mental health. For too long, though, uh, mental health lacked uh, targets. People waited lengthy periods to receive well-recognised evidence-based uh, treatment. The government is working to change that. Scotland was the first uh, nation in the UK to introduce a target to ensure faster access to psychological therapies for all ages. The target for boards is that patients will get a referral to treatment for psychological therapies within 18 weeks. This is a challenging target, uh, but we should recognise the work that boards have been doing to try and meet it. The latest uh, data shows that the average adjusted waiting time for psychological therapies is eight weeks, and 81% of people were seen within 18 weeks. Some boards are doing better than that. Others we know are not. This is a point that was made in Richard Simpson's amendment, as was uh, his, uh, our shared concern about uh, stigma. I should say at this stage we will be supporting uh, the Labour amendment uh, this evening. Uh, we've uh, been offering support to boards to tackle a uh, waiting list. I want to see uh, the good work sustained, but let me be clear, I want to see all the boards uh, meet the target, and that's why the government has embedded it into NHS Scotland's local delivery plan guidance for 2015-16. Uh, I want to talk a little about recovery. Uh, President officer, people with mental health problems have been at the forefront of rethinking what is meant by recovery. Uh, as the Scottish Recovery Network emphasises, people can and do recover from even the most serious and long-term mental health problems. The network also stresses that recovery is a personal journey and that's about living a meaningful and satisfying life with or without uh, symptoms. A meaningful and satisfying life is as important for people with a mental health problem as it is for people with a physical health problem. And one of our uh, challenges now is to address the higher uh, mortality rate of people with a, a mental health disorder compared to the general uh, population. We have produced guidance on how NHS boards could ensure good work between primary and secondary care and providing good quality physical health services to people with severe and enduring mental illness. Physical health improvement is built into the Scottish Recovery Indicator. Ensuring practice in mental health services relates to the factors which help recovery. Uh, President, obviously, the mental health of our uh, children and young people has been a focus of our efforts to improve Scotland's uh, mental health. We've increased the specialist child and adolescent mental health services workforce by almost 50 per cent since 2008, and we have introduced uh, a waiting time target for accessing child and adolescent mental health services to help drive improvements. In the two years between September 2012 and September 2014, the number of children and young people who have been seen by CAMS has increased by over 60 per cent. That is a phenomenal increase, reflecting more children and young people being referred uh, to serves it is little wonder then that this has been a, a challenging uh, target. Uh, President Officer, we've been transparent with publishing the data. Again, it's clear that some boards are doing better than others. And again, I make the point that I want all the boards to meet uh, the target. This target too is embedded into NHS Scotland's local uh, delivery plan guidance for 2015-16. Uh, uh, ensuring access to mental health services for children and young people is an absolute priority uh, for this government, though, and that is why not only have we increased the numbers employed in this area. Uh, do I have time, President Officer? Not much. Briefly. All right. Uh, given that only one health board in mainland Scotland has achieved the 18-week target for CAMS, when does the Minister expect that all health boards will be able to achieve that target? Well, Minister? I think I've made the point, uh, Ms Scanlon, I expect all health boards to achieve this target uh, this year. That is my expectation. We have set the target for a reason. We expect the health boards to achieve uh, that uh, target. Uh, President Officer, uh, as I uh, began to say, we have uh, not only increased the numbers employed in this year, but we have invested almost £17 million since 2009 to deliver faster access to child and adolescent mental health services being delivered in Scotland's uh, communities. And this spending comes as part of increased expenditure in mental health, up by £31.9 million to £899 million in 2012-13 from £867.1 million pounds in 2010-11. And we are investing an additional £15 million over the next three years to improve uh, mental 
health services uh, particularly. Uh, ensuring uh, the prompt treatment of people is a key priority for improving Scotland's mental health. What we know to be true of physical illness, that the sooner treatment begins, the sooner a person can recover, is invariably true in mental illness, President Officer. And of course, the more we do, the clearer we see how much more uh, we still need to do. I'm glad this Parliament has welcomed in uh, this year of 2015 with the mental health of all at its heart. And I ask that all of us, all members, uh, think about the right way forward. Many thanks. And I now call on Dr Richard Simpson to speak to move Amendment 11975.2. Dr Simpson, seven minutes, please. Thank you. Could I draw attention of members to my declaration in respect of Fellowship of the Royal College of Psychiatry, BMA... Microphone, Dr Simpson. Chair, my Chair in Psychology at University of Stirling. Can I say my, how much I welcome this debate as the first one for the new administration in health? I hope it will be the one of many because we've had a rather paucity of health debates in the past. Presiding officer, the, uh, and can I also welcome the minister to his first debate and, and say that how much I welcome the tone of his opening remarks, um, which are, are, are very welcome indeed. Uh, presiding officer, can I begin by saying that the, the inequality and false division into mind and body as separate entities occurred over a century and a half ago, and it has really dogged the biological med, uh, model of medicine ever since. GPs, as we know, treat most patients with mental illness and do so holistically, but GPs are confronted with serious difficulties in not having the time to manage complex mental and physical morbidity. This is particularly the case in deprived areas where mental health problems are massively more prevalent. The deep end practices have reported this as part of their view of the inverse care law, in other words, the application of resources in inverse to the, to the care needs. I welcome the appointment of the six link workers, but this is uh, just a beginning, I believe, that reads to be a much more dynamic and radical approach to primary care if the specialist services are not to be even further overwhelmed. I know that Malcolm Chisholm will speak a little more about primary care. In 1997, the mental health framework started by saying it was written to assist staff in health, social work, housing agencies to develop a joint approach to the planning, commissioning and provision of integrated mental health services. It was also intended to assist the people who use these services, those who care for them and the staff in voluntary and other agencies to play their part as partners and stakeholders. That introductory message is as relevant today, I believe, as it was then. That framework, however, was mainly directed at the problem of severe and enduring mental illnesses. And certainly much progress has been made in the management of psychotic and, uh, illness and dementia, uh, but less so in personality disorder and in developmental disorders. Much, of course, has happened since 1997. The closure of old and unsuitable hospitals has continued. And with the help of PPP, though I know that the SNP don't approve of that, but presumably the continuing NDP model, which is similar, that, that, that closure rate and replacement rate has intensified. We passed the Adults with Incapacity Act in 2000, and uh, uh, Mary Scan will remember our debates on that issue. The Milan Commission reported in 1999 with 10 principles, which they enunciated, and these were incorporated into the 2003 Mental Health Act. That was the first time in my professional or political life that a Scottish Act was not simply a tartanised version of a UK Act. It led the way, was hailed in Europe as a piece of for, uh, really far-thinking legislation and was actually eventually copied in England. So they actually copied us. We led the way. I know that further attention is now being paid to the human rights of patients with mental illness. And can I suggest to the Minister that this may require a larger review of the interaction of these acts than has been possible in the rather limited McManus review which we're currently considering. The Minister referred to the CME anti-stigmatisation programme which was established in, by Malcolm Chisholm as, as the Minister at the time. And it's in its first four years, it had begun the process of transforming public and in part media attitudes. But regrettably, the social attitudes survey in 2013, as the Minister has alluded to, shows that some attitudes have not continued to improve and in some respects have gone backwards. The overdue refounding, as it's been titled, of that programme, in my view, I think has too, far too great an emphasis on very short programmes. They are one-year programmes, and we are really beset by one-year-itis in, in our projects. We should be building on what has actually worked before to a far greater extent. 
In 2006, there was the follow-up strategy under Labour of delivering for mental health, which introduced standards and integrated care pathways for severe and enduring illness. Uh, th this, the benefit of this has been reflected in the initial reduction within a year by 25% of readmissions, and this process has continued under the current government and is very welcome. The heat target for reductions in suicide, which Labour introduced, has also been continued by the present government and has led to a substantial reduction, even if it's missed its target. But it is to the government's accommodation that it has not been an increased rate under recession, as has occurred in many European countries. The heat target for antidepressant prescriptions to reduce these has been, in my view, wisely dropped. It was in part a proxy for psychological treatments. But actually, better quality prescribing has meant a rise in the amount and the length of treatment. So that's something that we commend the government again for, for, under, for, for changing that heat target. Uh, the, the heat target, which they did introduce in 2010, of a 90% referral to treatment for psychological therapies, hasn't been met, although, as the minister said, there's been really quite good progress. But again, as the minister said, this masks huge variation with Lanarkshire and Glasgow performing well into the 80s, and yet Lothian and Forth Valley, the area in which I introduced community psychology for the first time in Scotland in 1982, depressingly low at 40%. And this is why we've called again in this area for rigorous inspection, clear agreed plans of action to match the improved reporting that is demonstrating that these matters are hugely variable. Dementia diagnosis has improved and the standards for support have been effective. The standards for support have been effective. But there are serious problems of failure to undertake or record cognitive assessment in the acute uh, elderly inspections by Health Improvement Scotland. Staff may feel that this cognitive assessment is not a priority, but it really is. It's very important. Progress in a number of other specific areas has also been slow. Health inequalities have not, incre have not reduced, they have actually increased. CAMS, as the Minister has ag accepted, is still a major challenge, and I welcome the targets, tough targets that the Government has set in this respect, although they have not been met, as Mary Scanlon has said. Can I suggest strongly to the Minister that in order to achieve these targets, it is absolutely necessary to support the lower tier services, because these will actually reduce demand. And if you look at the last two quarters of referrals to CAMS, these have increased hugely and will continue to do so unless the lower tier services are improved. For example, the recent spread of the Place to Be service from a cluster in Nidri Primary okay, Schools in Edinburgh to, close. to East Lothian in Glasgow, uh, all in more deprived areas, is welcome as our Home Start Triple P Parenting and Family Nurse Partnership. But this isn't enough. Minister, I hope this is the first of many debates. There are many areas which we've not covered especially prisoners, um, the question of psychiatry, if in forensic psychiatry, substance use, day. veterans, etc. But I hope, uh, I welcome the fact that the amendment in my name has been accepted and I move that amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Now I call on Mary Scanlon to speak to and move amendment 11975.3. Scanlon, five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I first of all welcome the Minister to his new portfolio and uh, just to say that there is certainly considerable scope uh, to do so much more to improve mental health services and uh, it's one of these issues that tends to gain cross-party support uh, with very little party political intervention. It is so important. Uh, we are supporting the government's motion today and the amendments in the name of Richard Simpson and Jim Hume and uh, I move the amendment in my name. Uh, I'm very pleased to start 2015 with a debate on mental health and uh, in the short time available I hope I can cover uh, some uh, concerns regarding the mental health strategy in particular which runs from 2012 uh, and all the commitments should be achieved by the end of this year. Conservatives want to see progress in improving mental health and well-being, so today is an opportunity to review the government's report card. Uh, as Richard uh, Simpson said, the SNP has actually had two debates specifically on mental health, apart from dementia. There's been two debates on mental health since 2007. One in September 2011 and the other in January 2013. This is confirmed by SPICE. But I would have thought that mental health would at least justify an annual update and a debate 
at the very least, although I do appreciate that the Health Committee is currently looking at a mental health bill. But for those of us who were on the Health Committee in 2003, like Richard Simpson and I, we had high hopes that the Mental Health Care and Treatment Act would make a huge difference to service users, and today is our opportunity to look at that. I first want to welcome something I read in the Penumbra briefing, that they have now developed a personal outcomes pro approach with an internationally recognised tool called Individual Recovery Outcomes Counter. This has been developed along with Aberdeen University and it allows self-assessment of mental health and wellbeing to track improvements. For so long we say, oh, we've given 10,000, we've given 10 million. We've given 20 million and we sit back and think, well, that's fine. We've thrown the money there, but we've never measured the outcomes. So I want to put that on record, how much I thoroughly welcome that. But given that this is the Minister's first mental health debate, can I draw his attention to uh, some of the progress in the commitments of the government strategy? Whilst I do appreciate that the timing is to be achieved by the end of this year, I'll just pick out a few. Commitment one, a 10-year follow-up to Sandra Grant's report to be published in 2014. Nothing. Commitment six, a Scotland-wide approach to improving mental health through new technology with NHS 24. To date, nothing. Commitment 12, raised by all three opposition parties in their amendments today. A government commitment to reduce the number of children being treated in adult psychiatric wards, something we spoke about in 2003. But according to the Mental Welfare Commission's most recent annual report, the number of children treated in adult wards in 2013 rose to 202 from 177 the previous year. So again, no progress there. Commitment 26. Audit of inpatient estate. July 2014 confirmed there are fewer beds, no reasons for, cha for changing uh, why people are there, and no significant uh, aspects looking at future strategy or action as a result. Commitment 30, mentioned by Richard Simpson, women in prison with borderline personality disorder. Nothing. Commitment 33, to develop appropriate specialist capability in respect of developmental disorders, something Richard Simpson raised in 2003. Again, nothing. I do appreciate the strategies due for completion uh, later this year, but many targets have already been missed, and there is a huge amount of work to do this year in order to meet the uh, commitments given. And I, I'm summing up as well. So my final point, presiding officer, is as if this wasn't poor enough, when you look at the psychological therapies, the 90% commitment to meet the 18 weeks from referral to treatment was met by four out of 14 health boards, with more than 14,000 people still waiting to be seen across the country. Again, it's not good enough. There's been plenty please. time to plan for resources, and the lack of alternative psychological set therapies probably explains why uh, so many people are on antidepressants, and I'll pick that up in the summing up. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Jim Hume to speak to move Amendment 11975.1. Mr Hume, five minutes, please. Uh, th thank you, pres Presiding Officer, and I congratulate Jamie Hepburn on his first government motion and uh, welcome him to his new post, which I am pleased to see uh, included in the title is mental health. And uh, of course, we'll be happy to work with him constructively uh, in the future. I think it's also fitting that mental health is the topic of one of the first debates of this new year, because with this year seeing the end of the current mental health strat strategy for Scotland, I think we have a golden opportunity to change the way that mental health is viewed and treated. And of course, we need to ensure that, uh, that we have a meaningful new strategy in place a year from now. I think for too long, mental health has been something which has not been spoken about, and in treatment terms, it has been the Cinderella service within the NHS. Our RCN brief briefing, the Royal College of Nurses, stated that uh, mental health is often the poor relation to physical health when it comes to priority and funding within the NHS. 
So I welcome the fact that in Scotland we have uh, heat targets for mental health services, but uh, I don't think that does go far enough. So I would like the government to follow the UK government's lead and lay out quite clearly in legislation that mental and physical health are recognised equally. And I don't think that's the same as uh, Jamie Hepburn when he mentioned that, that uh, they should be improved. Of course they should improve, but that doesn't make them equal. I so I was also... A, a, yeah, of course you may. Jamie Hepburn. Thank, I, I thank uh, Mr Hume uh, for giving way. Uh, the uh, UK government has uh, put in a requirement, this is the supposed parity uh, uh, requirement in the Health and Social Care Act, which says the, says the Secretary of State must continue the promotion in England of a comprehensive health service designed to secure improvement in the physical and mental health of the people of, of England. Health, Section 1 of the National Health Service of Scotland Act 1978 says it shall continue to be the duty of Scottish Minister to promote in Scotland a comprehensive integrated health service designed to secure improvement in the physical and mental health of the people of Scotland. It's not such a big difference, is it? Jim Hill? Well, there is a difference because in, in, down south of the border they've actually put it in legislation that the, it, is a, it is on a, on a parity. So I, I, I thought, I thought the, today the government's motion... Um, it didn't make any great reference to the pressure on NHS services and that concerns that I have raised in this chamber on, on many uh, occasions. Uh, the, we do have a consensus emerging around this uh, as an issue which needs to be addressed now and is to be welcomed. The investment is to be welcomed. Uh, of course, it's never enough. If the Scottish Government, uh, we really need to acknowledge the weaknesses so therefore we can hope that the situation will improve. Uh, one in four people will have mental ill health at some point in their lives. 10% of children and young people in Scotland have mental health problems that are so significant they impact on their daily lives. Without proper support and treatment, this thing, impact can be devastating, affecting education or work or an individual's home life and their relationships. For each and every one of these individuals getting the right treatment and support quickly, I think is absolutely essential. But it's clear that in Scotland they are not getting the services that they need and, and deserve. NHS boards are failing to meet targets put in place by this government. 90% of young people needing treatment should be seen within 26 weeks, but in six of Scotland's 14 health boards, they aren't. There's been a 12% increase in the number of children and young people waiting upwards of six months for treatment. Uh, our SAMH briefing for this debate stated it's impossible that the 18-week targets for psychological therapies will be met. The most recent figures show that only four out of 14 health boards meet the 90% target, with more than 14,000 people still waiting to be seen across the country. SAMH also reported that two-fifths of GPs have said that they have not referred anyone for psychological therapies recently because waiting times are too long. So the current level of ref referrals does not reflect need, and yet still people are waiting too long and the targets are being missed. The £15 million over three years pledged by the Scottish Government for improvements in primary care level mental health services is very welcome. Of course, it's not enough to see the transformation we do need. It's not just waiting things which are an issue, it's also the environment in which we treat these vulnerable young people. Guidelines are clear, treating young people in adult psychiatric units should only occur in exceptional cases. But the Mental Welfare Commission for Scotland found that last year 202 young people were treated in adult wards, up from 177 the year before. Because Scotland does not have specialist secure healthcare services for young people, young people are placed in specialist units in England. So this makes it difficult those, for the young person to retain links with family and local services, and of course is expensive. In concluding, all mental health services need to be the best that they can be, evidence-led and responsive to local demand. Individuals receiving the care they need in the setting which is most appropriate for them, no matter where they live. I move the amendment in my name. Many thanks. And we now move to open debate. Call on Dennis Robertson to be followed by Sandra White. Up to four minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And can I also welcome the Minister to his new post? Uh, and again, with a specific aspect to mental health, I think this is something that uh, I sincerely hope that the Minister and I can have dialogue about uh, in the continued future. Presiding Officer, mental health, we, th there is a stigma. Um, and it's an unfortunate one, but it, it exists. And I think we need to be able to sort of recognise its, its existence. And it's how we actually move forward from that. And, and legislation in itself cannot, you know, uh, 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 solve this problem. And it is about attitude. And it's about attitude sometimes to one's self. 
and about recognising that if you have a physical illness, you can maybe go to the doctor and talk about it, but when you have a mental illness sometimes, or you're not feeling too good, that you sometimes shy away from it. And I don't know, you know how we actually get over this, but it needs to be a dialogue that, that I think we need to continue to have, and I certainly look forward to further debates. Political officer, I worked in the third sector before coming to this chamber, or this parliament, sorry. And what I did recognise with people with uh, sensory loss, they went through a period of, of adjustment. And that adjustment meant that their well-being, their mental health was always impaired because they were losing their ability to do things that they'd always been able to do in, in the past. But it was a short term for many in that adjustment. And once they realised the sort of can-do uh, approach, you know, life did become better. Now, not for everyone, presiding officer, but for the majority of people coming to terms with their condition um, is, is the way forward. And as Penumbra said that um, the peer support is a, you know, can be uh, a, a, an asset to someone moving forward. And I've seen this uh, in many aspects of the work that I did uh, in, previous, uh, in my previous existence in the social work and care sector. But I want to, the, I want to commend the government on, on its approach because Mary Scanlon mentioned the mental health strategy. Now, the government recognised that we needed to improve the services for people with mental health. It went out in a consultation process, an extensive consultation, and it came up with key findings. They didn't shy away from the problem. It was a recognition that it's complex and it needs to be resolved. And it can't just be resolved by putting money into it. It needs to be resolved in an effective and an appropriate way. And that is sometimes using the appropriate specialists. Dr Simpson mentioned the family nurse partnerships, for instance. That's an excellent way of sometimes coming to terms with some of the problems that, that, that already exist within our communities. The Minister's aware, I'm sure, eh, of my own personal circumstances. And when we look at the child and adolescent eh, mental health service, I know it is lacking in some areas. And I know that sometimes that initial intervention is essential to try and, and offset that the, 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 the problems that some of our young people do have. Now, not every child and adolescent will have their mental health improved uh, through CAMS and through the appropriate psychological services because the, the condition is perhaps e extreme in some cases. But what we need to do is to ensure that someone's listening at the outset, presiding officer. Now, if that referral comes from a GP and is a referred on, then we need to do our best to try and ensure that the young person is seen by the most appropriate specialist uh, within the, 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 the healthcare sector. Now, where I would like to see uh, the improvements, uh, presiding officer, is perhaps manage clinical networks for sp specific conditions. And certainly within the sort of eating disorder aspect, I would love to see something like that actually happening to try and prevent deaths within uh, our communities of our young people with eating disorders. And I'm sure the Minister okay, and I will have this discussion close, uh, in the future. But once again, presiding officer, I commend the government for the work that they are doing and the recognition that more needs to be done. Thank you. Many thanks. I now call on Sandra White to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer, and can I also welcome Jamie Hepburn to his job, and in particular that of the Mental Health Minister, a role which I know Jamie, Mr Hepburn uh, will give uh, his full attention to. Uh, I do welcome the strategies put forward by previous and present governments to tackle mental health illness, and in particular the See Me campaign that's been mentioned by uh, Dr Simpson, launched in 2002 uh, to tackle the stigma of mental health, and I really think it's been a, a huge success, and I would look forward to more strategies such as that. I think it has uh, you know, raised awareness of uh, mental health issues, and have been very welcome throughout the, the communities, certainly in the community in Glasgow, which uh, I represent. Uh, the mental health strategy published in 2012 with its seven key themes and its four key change areas, I think is a very important piece of work. And I know that Mary Scanlon had mentioned that. And I'm particularly keen on two of the key change areas uh, mentioned in there. And uh, the first one is rethinking how we respond to common mental health problems. 
and the other one is community inpatient and crisis services, particularly the community part, uh, is very interesting to myself. And the reason I raise these is because when you look at you work in the community, you see how uh, mental health services are delivered in the community. I just wondered if these are applied properly, uh, these uh, areas are applied properly, whether they would be able to enhance the services which uh, are there at the moment. And I want to pick up on two uh, of the issues. One of the local services, my area, which I thought perhaps perhaps may have been enhanced by that, in fact, being able to keep open is the Child Reed Centre in Elm Bank Street in my constituency. Now, it closed its doors in May 2014, after 21 years of service in the, in the Glasgow area. It was very, very much loved by users and the staff alike. And when I used to visit, they had so many different things ongoing. It was a sheer joy to visit, and people got a lot out of it. Unfortunately, it closed its doors, as I said, in May 2014, and the reason it closed its doors was the withdrawal of core funding by Glasgow City Council and the reliance on personal funds and direct payments. And I do wonder if these two key change areas, which I have already mentioned, if that had been applied, would it have ensured that the Charlie Reed Centre stayed open or ensure that other Charlie Reed Centres and inverted commons would stay open? There's no doubt uh, that the knock-on effect from this closure of the Charlie Reed Centre in Glasgow is going to have on uh, GAMH, which is the Glasgow Centre for Mental Health, which I know that my colleague John Mason will raise in his contribution. Uh, other issue I want to raise in, uh, is that of older people in isolation. And uh, this leads to depression, and that can have a really devastating impact on people's lives. And once again, I look to the key change areas, which, as I said, I've already mentioned, the localised areas, communities. And the reason I ask that is, and perhaps the Minister, I know it's your first outing uh, Minister uh, as this particular Minister, but I just wonder, if lo were local authorities uh, basically involved in this strategy? Because lots of the, the community-led uh, issues, in my area in particular, it's the reason that they're closed down, they're not being used because of uh, funding being withdrawn by local authorities. And, you know, people in my area, and the elderly people going to daycare centres, Money has been withdrawn uh, from, from Glasgow City Council in regard to them getting out to daycare centres. And it's a lifeline for many of the elderly people. And some of these people are being charged £15 a day to use that. So I would just like to say, when perhaps you're summing up or when the strategy is published at the end of the year, which has already been mentioned, one of the issues that I raise uh, could be looked at in the respect of local authorities having the involvement with the strategy or even perhaps more involvement with the strategy. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. And thank you. And I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by John uh, Mason. Officer, I welcome the Minister to his post and also welcome the many developments that have been in mental health since uh, 1999 with a great deal of uh, cont continuity from one administration to another. I think it's right, though, in debates like this that we highlight the problems that exist, particularly when those problems have been brought to us by uh, constituents. And there are two uh, uh, examples of that that I want to refer to the, uh, today. The first was a, a woman uh, who came to see me quite uh, recently who was uh, anxious and she met the criteria uh, uh, for referral for psychological therapy as has been confirmed recently by an NHS helpline and yet her GP did not uh, refer her and I wonder how common that is. I note in the Sam H briefing for today's debate it says that two-fifths of GPs haven't referred anyone for psychological therapies because waiting lists are too long. And they quote one particular GP who says, and I quote, access to psychological therapies is extremely poor with long waits, uh, long and unacceptable wait times. GPs feel under pressure not to refer people to already stretched services. So, so I am very uh, concerned by that uh, Sam H uh, research as well as by the experience of my constituents. So although four health boards out of 14 meet the 18 week uh, target for uh, access to psychological therapies, it may well be that the situation is worse because of uh, unmet need through non-referral. So there's definitely a big uh, challenge uh, there. Now, of course, there may be other factors involved here, and, and, and I'm a great fan of GPs, including Dr. Simpson, and a special fan of my own GP, but let's sometimes uh, be realistic and accept that uh, some GPs are probably not uh, as knowledgeable about mental health as they should be. Some people have said there should be more about mental health 
in GP training, and I note that uh, an expansion of GP training uh, to, uh, presumably, um, once you're training post-degree, post uh, an expansion of GP training to include more NHA, uh, mental health placements is a recommendation of the recent uh, Shape of Training UK report, and the Royal College of Psychiatrists briefing for today's debate says that they support that uh, recommendation. So, the SAMH research on GPs is also interesting. They say that 90% of GPs said they wanted more information on local social prescribing opportunities and that almost 50% were not aware of sign guidelines on non-pharmaceutical treatments for depression. So I think realistically there is a room for some work in that area. And indeed, if you want to find out more about it, come to the SAMH reception, which I'm sponsoring next Thursday on mental health and primary care. Uh, excellent timing there. But of course, there are many good examples of mental health and primary care in the community more generally. Richard Simpson referred to the link workers in the deep end, project, uh, deep end practices. Let's uh, see a bit more of that. There's all the great nursing projects. Again, I, I'll be highlighting them in my members' debate tomorrow. Uh, uh, a lot of them have a mental health uh, focus. And of course, there's the community projects that I'm sure we all have in our own constituencies, such as, for example, for me, the Pilton Community Health Projects, with its women supporting women, uh, uh, counselling and other work that's a lot of which is to do with mental health. Now, the second woman I, woman I referred to at the beginning as an even uh, more uh, distressing example because her son uh, committed suicide and she felt that there was no help uh, and services available for him. This woman, Laura Nolan, has set up a trust called the Joshua Nolan Trust. She's done amazing work in the last year, fundraising uh, to raise money for counselling uh, for those who can't get uh, services on the NHS. That, of course, shouldn't be necessary, but we should pay tribute to all the work she's done. And she's now also starting to work uh, in terms of the awareness of mental health uh, in schools. And that's, of course, part of that very important public mental health uh, agenda, which includes the, the you work need to bring your me, remarks to a close. Uh, see me. And that, of course, is something that we have to work uh, on as well. I had a, a lot more to say about young people and mental health, but I'm being told to uh, stop. So I shall. Thank you. John Mason, followed by Linda Fabiani. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. And uh, on 28th of October, we debated, last debated mental health, I think, on a motion uh, tabled by Linda Fabiani. And it's good that we're returning to the subject today uh, in government time. Uh, I would like to start off by focusing on GAMH, the Glasgow Association for Mental Health, uh, which is a charity based in my constituency. Members may know that Glasgow City Council are planning to cut the GAMH budget pretty severely, in fact, by 40% or £888,000. Now, of course, all budgets are under pressure and everyone expects their budgets to fall a few percent each year. But this is much more severe and represents a real shift of resources away from this section of mental health provision. If we are serious about preventative expenditure and trying to tackle the problems before they escalate, I am really puzzled as to what the thinking is behind these Glasgow cuts. The Evening Times of 30th December ca carried the story of Jenny Robertson, who was a victim of sexual abuse as a youngster and who had gone through various treatment regimes, including prescribed drugs and electroconvulsive therapy. But one of the things that has helped her most was the input from GAMH. I have had some connection with GAMH, including almost exactly a year ago when they launched a book of writings by folk with mental health issues in Denison in my constituency. This was a really impressive and moving event, and the main speaker at the launch was Liz Lockhead, who spoke in a very personal way about her own experiences. It strikes me that one of the things uh, people with mental health issues need is time, including time spent being listened to so that someone really understands their problems, time to form friendships and trust people, time to take part in physical activities or hobbies, which can be a real help, time to reflect and perhaps write of their experiences. And this is exactly the kind of thing that GAMH and I'm certain other or similar organisations do. Giving people a few pills may be quicker and it may be cheaper, but I am increasingly certain that this is not always the answer. I've raised the question of GAMH with Glasgow City Council and I have to say I was somewhat unhappy with a number of points in their reply of 2nd December. For example, they said, quote, a citizen's engagement with social work should only ever be, in the main, transitory in nature, unquote. But surely, as with physical disability or illness, some conditions are long-term in the mental health realm. Now, I understand the decision to cut funding in Glasgow has been called in by committee, and I very much hope the decision will be reconsidered. 
if the government is able to make any representations to the Council on behalf of some very vulnerable people, that would be very much appreciated. Just a few other points I would want to make in relation to mental health more generally, as has already been mentioned, the continuing challenge of stigma. Uh, we had a very negative reaction from some folk, admittedly a minority, uh, in, my, in a community in uh, my constituency when it was proposed to build a care home for folk with mental health issues. And we do need to really continue working, I think, to counteract such stigma. And also the link between poverty and poor mental health. Uh, Audit Scotland figures uh, show that GP consultations for depression and anxiety ranged from 28 per thousand in the least deprived areas to 62 per thousand in the more deprived areas. And similarly, suicide is three times higher in the most deprived areas. Finally, can I say that while uh, we should talk about the shortcomings and the things that we want to see improved, we do need to keep things in perspective. During recess, I was reading a report about Cambodia, where the government has stated they will not look at mental health issues because they have so many other issues like malaria to deal with. You need to bring your remarks to a close. And at the weekend, I spoke to a Canadian who has worked all over the world and currently in Mozambique, and he was saying one thing we must not forget is how superb the NHS is by world standards. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Mason. Linda Fabiani, followed by Paul Martin. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, of course, uh, this is a big, big subject, and I, I know that Mary Scanlon feels that it's not often given enough time, but I think it's one of these subjects affecting so many people that we, we could literally talk about this constantly. And for that reason, we, we have to hone down our own contributions, as everyone has today. I was particularly interested today in the aspects of the government motion uh, that talk about mental health and well-being, because well-being is such a very, very important word about someone's state of health, whether it be physical health, whether it be mental health. But I'm also interested in the, the Mental Health Innovation Fund, and I would quite like to hear a lot more about that, because I'm reading that it's about identifying new ways of treating people in the early stages. And it ties in with primary care services as well. And um, Malcolm Chisholm referred to the Sam H briefing, and I think Richard Simpson spoke about primary care services too, and the importance of primary care in that early identification understanding and also trying to take away some of that stigma. I can't remember which research it was, but I do remember previously reading some research which said that people felt that even their GPs were stigmatising them sometimes when they went along looking for help. So there's a big awareness raising exercise to go on as well. Beyond that, I mean, all these things tie in, and the government's mental health strategy ties in with the NHS Scotland quality strategy about health and care to be person-centred, safe and effective. And I think that's particularly relevant to mental health issues. It's got to be person-centred. It's got to suit uh, that person. And that joined-up issue, it's not just about within the health portfolio. It should be joined up across portfolios, across every aspect of life, because that's what then leads to an overall sense of well-being. And I think too often we separate these things and we put them into categories. Um, and when you look at, for example, health budgets, and then you look at um, transport budgets, you look at arts and culture budgets, sometimes the pulling together of these creates that whole and creates that sense of well-being. I see it regularly in my own constituency. Uh, I've spoken about Theatre Nemo many, many times, and they do wonderful stuff in the arts. But another one I want to mention today, um, and it ties in very much with um, new towns, because new towns are different from other town centres. New towns um, like Cumbernauld, Glenrothes, East Cobride, my own, um, the shopping centre is the town centre. And I want to talk today a wee bit about uh, shop mobility. And yes, they supply um, disability um, carts and bikes and trolleys and things within the centre. But it's not just about shops. It's about that ability for people to feel, feel part of their own community, be in their own town centre, where, they, as I say, not just shops, but libraries, cafes, places where they meet people. People who live in new towns don't just walk out the door and walk along to local shops. They have to go to the, the town centre. So I would like to see a lot more joined up thinking across portfolios. 
And I would ask um, Mr Hepburn in this new role um, to look at reaching out beyond his own portfolio and seeing where the, the Mental Health Innovation Fund can be used, augmented and helped by other aspects of government and uh, really look at promoting that sense of well-being that doesn't just come from walking into your GP and being told that you will get help by referral, you but that comes close. from feeling that you have a very useful life. Thank you, President. Thank you. Paul Martin, followed by Mark MacDonald. Uh, President Officer, can I, like others, uh, welcome the Minister to his uh, new post, and uh, I think he should take in good spirit some of the uh, robust exchanges that we've heard from uh, a number of members, and I actually think these uh, robust exchanges should ensure uh, that we learn from uh, some of the challenges that, that faces. And I think some of the measures that have to be met uh, in the current mental health strategy that have not been met, I think the Minister should take on board. Uh, and I think there should be absolutely no doubt uh, that we should include, and the government should include in future business, uh, the opportunity for us to, to revisit the discussion and the debate that we've had today uh, and ensure that we can take these issues forward. And I hope uh, in the Minister's closing remarks that he can show humility and recognise that some of these uh, challenges that face the government have not been met uh, and come forward at a very early stage with how the Minister intends to take them forward. And I do appreciate what a complex area that this is, uh, but we have to recognise that the patient experience out there is not always as positive as it should be, and whatever measures that we can put in place to improve that would be welcomed. Uh, can I take this opportunity, uh, like others, to uh, recognise the dedication of the staff who treat people with mental health uh, uh, conditions? Uh, I think they're to be commended for their good work, and I do over the years uh, dealt with many members of staff who have shown absolute uh, dedication uh, to what is a complex area uh, and in the challenges that we fa they face both in uh, resources uh, and the bureaucracies that exist uh, in the system as well uh, they're to be commended uh, for uh, the work that they do I think for every case of uh, mistreatment or misdiagnosis we should recognise that sometimes uh, those who are treated uh, by the health professionals don't always get the best treatment uh, that they should uh, and people do find themselves in that uh, process of the bureaucracy of making complaints and being concerned that perhaps a condition has not been met as best as it possibly could be. Because I, know, so I would like to raise one particular case uh, of a constituent who, I'd like very similar to Malcolm Chisholm's uh, particular case, a constituent who visited me uh, last, just last month, uh, who is a constituent who suffers from a bipolar condition who contacted me uh, and said that she had a prescription from uh, the Centre of Integrated Care at the NHS homeopathic facility in Glasgow. Uh, having been a nurse for over 30 years, she had to give up work and get treatment and get better and get back to the job that she'd done for many years. Her new treatment has been working well uh, and she's beginning to return back into the state she found herself in previously. However, presiding officer, and similar to Malcolm Chisholm's case, uh, her own GP refused uh, to give her the, prescri the pre prescription that she had requested. Unfortunately, because of her GP's refusal to provide that repeat prescription, she has found her condition has deteriorated. The presenter also find that uh, unacceptable, and it perhaps could be similar to Malcolm Chisholm's case uh, that my constituent's uh, GP has not been able to refer my constituent to those services because those services are not available. Now, that is, for me, a very clear case of a patient experience that's went wrong uh, unacceptably, and her condition has now deteriorated. Uh, now, she wants the opportunity to be able to raise that as a, an official complaint and is currently going through the bureaucracy of taking that forward. But I would ask the Minister to, in his new role, ensure that he takes on board the patient experiences of those out there who are experiencing uh, these very real-life experiences and ensure that we can take action. I uh, also ask members to support the motion in the name of government today uh, and the amendments that have been brought forward as well. Thank you, Mr Martin. To close the open debate, Mark MacDonald. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I begin by uh, welcoming the Minister to his new role and indeed welcome the, the tone that he struck uh, in, in opening this debate? And I think, broadly speaking, it has been a constructive debate that we've been having. I think that there are 
a number of sort of key areas that I wanted to touch on. I think the first was around stigma, which has been mentioned by a, a number of members. Um, I noted the, the rather stark figures in the briefing provided to us by the Alliance, which said a, a quarter of people had experienced a, a mental health problem at some time, uh, but almost half of people said if they were experiencing mental health problems, they wouldn't want people knowing about it. And indeed, one in six people said they would find it difficult to talk to someone with a mental health problem. And only 82% of people said that they thought people with mental health problems should have the same rights as anyone else. That's very troubling um, for, for anyone to read that. And, and those of us who, um, I mean, when we talk about one in four people being affected by a mental health problem, let's not be about the Bush presiding officer. That's essentially 30 odd members of this chamber could at one stage in their lives be affected by a mental health condition. Uh, most of us will have somebody in our family and friend networks who either exp are experiencing currently or have experienced at some stage or will experience at some point in the future mental ill health. So it's not just our responsibility as parliamentarians and politicians, it's our responsibility as those who uh, have those loved ones in our networks who are likely to be affected as well. And I think Linda Fabiani made the point that it's, it's not just the responsibility of the health service or even necessarily of the social care services, it's everyone's responsibility to ensure good mental health. And it's worth noting as well that the length of time that an individual will spend uh, being treated for a mental health condition will vary from person to person because each individual um, by their nature will experience mental health conditions in a different way. It's not the same. Uh, while, while I, uh, I'll make this point that, that I don't think uh, this, uh, uh, this needs to be uh, put into new legislation because I think the Minister already highlighted that it's in legislation already. But I do think it is important that mental health receives a priority uh, treatment and I believe that that is uh, as much down to attitude as it is down to any form of legislation but at the same time um, if a person breaks their leg you can roughly gauge the length of time it is going to take before they're going to have to have the cast taken off before they're going to be able to walk again. With somebody with a mental health condition it's less easy to predict exactly at what point that individual will no longer require treatment and that's something that I think bears uh, remembering when we're talking about treatment and we're talking about the kinds of treatments that are being offered. Um, in terms of uh, negative influences, I think it's worth noting that um, in the briefings that we've received, certainly the briefings from Inclusion Scotland and from the Alliance, that the impact of welfare reform on mental health, particularly on those who are already suffering uh, from uh, significant mental health conditions, but also those who are finding anxiety and stress increasing and therefore that having a negative impact on their mental health uh, is being documented by a range of organisations across Scotland. So we must accept that external factors are going to have an impact on the ability of an individual to enjoy good mental health, but also to recover from a situation where their mental health deteriorates. Finally, I just want to touch on something positive from, from a local perspective. Um, I noted in the Press and Journal in October uh, a, a fantastic uh, rating of uh, excellent from the care inspectorate for the service provided by VSA at Westerton Crescent, which switched from uh, in February 2014 from being a care home to a housing support service for individuals with mental health conditions. Um, there is a lot of positive work going on there. I hope to visit the facility soon, and it's worth recognising the strong work that the voluntary sector plays in uh, ensuring that those with mental health conditions get the best support they require. Thank you. We now move to wind-up speeches. I uh, call Jim Hume, four minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As I said in my opening speech, I, I do welcome the consensus which is emerging for action on mental health uh, uh, today. Uh, I think the de debate has also highlighted some of the concerns which exist around treatment and service avail availability. I'm glad the Minister uh, wants all boards to meet the, the heat targets within the year, but of course, with the uh, loss of beds and the cuts to experienced and specialist staff, that may be difficult. I think we must recognise some of the weaknesses as well as the, the ambitions that there are, as if we do not do so, we'll fail to make progress. And that's, of course, something uh, no, none of us want or, or we can afford. I, I was a wee bit disappointed, I must say, in the amendments from the Conservatives and Labour for perhaps not going far enough. They, they accept that there is parity between physical and mental health, Hill, ill health, I should say, uh, which I do not think the, is the case. The RCN say is not the case. The evidence is there. GPs are not referring to talking therapies 
because they know the pressure on, on services. I was glad that Richard Simpson uh, bro brought up, uh, I really only have uh, three minutes left, I'm sorry, uh, Minister. Glad Richard Simpson mentioned uh, human rights and have concerns that guardianships are uh, being more and more used for those with learning disorders, uh, but I think I'll, I'll leave that for, for another day. Not having quality services in suitable surroundings compromises the recovery of individuals and in turn, I believe, compromises their health and their future. For the most serious cases, we rely on the expert knowledge of mental health officers. It's hugely worrying, therefore, that mental health officer numbers are in inadequate for demand and that, because of that, there was a 5% fall across Scotland in mental health officer consent for emergency detention in a hospital. People should not be detained without this consent unless it is totally impractical. Yet 42% of detentions had no mental health officer consent. So we back the calls made by the Mental Welfare Commission for an urgent recruitment and training strategy for mental health officers, and we thank them for highlighting that need. Campaigns like See Me, mentioned by many, have gone some way to addressing the stigma attached to mental health, but that stigma does still exist. Nine out of 10 people suffering from mental health, ill health have experienced discrimination. That's unacceptable, so we must do more. We look forward to that revised mental health strategy this year, and I hope the Minister will listen carefully to what has been said here today and to those involved on a daily basis have raised as issues in their meetings and briefings with all of us. We can't make progress unless we deal with the concerns and the, the failings. I reiterate the call of the Scottish Liberal Democrats to set out in law that mental and physical health deserves equal recognition, and, and I do believe that doing so will not only help to ensure improvements and treatments for those with mental health, but will also, of course, help to address stigma where it e exists. I, I was a little bit surprised that uh, Mary Scanlon gave a, a thorough critique of, of the lack of progress in the mental health strategy, but is supporting the government's motion today, which I believe, of course, doesn't go far enough. Today, today's debate is a welcome step, but it's a small step. I think we must keep working to improve that situation. I'm happy to do so in a consensual manner. And I just want to finish by stating my wholehearted support and thanks for those working in the NHS, across, of course, local authorities and the third sector to provide mental health treatment. We know without them that individuals would be lost and the picture as a whole would be a lot darker. But those individuals are, are calling for real action now, and we must listen to that call and act on that. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Hume. Mary Scanlon. Thank you, <coughs> Presiding Officer. Can I first address a um, couple of points raised by Jim Hume? We are uh, uh, supporting the government's motion today, and the reason is that we do welcome the level of interest and commitment and I think I rightly went through the commitments made in the mental health strategy. So although they haven't achieved, been achieved, I look forward to achieving them. I'm reminding the Minister of what we're looking for, but I do welcome uh, the progress that has been made. Uh, and I also look forward to further progress in improving mental health. So yes, it wasn't a, a huge motion, but I don't think we're in a position to be churlish. We do have a new minister. Uh, it's his first outing. And uh, I think that much more work can be done. Uh, and I think the second point uh, that Jim Hume uh, made about um, the parity between mental and physical health, I would uh, refer him to a statement by Earl Howe um, at Westminster on the 19th of December, which sets out various new waiting targets, etc. I don't want to use my time to talk about West, what Westminster are doing but rather what we're doing here. It's a very short debate, and if I haven't covered everything Jim Hume would expect, ex expect, it's not because I'm not committed to it, it's due to the shortage of time. I think it's been a very short but important debate. Uh, I found uh, Linda Fabiani, um, I thought Linda made very good points on the joined up approach. Uh, and also John Mason, I, I liked what John Mason was saying about um, other therapies than... Uh, uh, antidepressants. Um, and that really takes me to my uh, next point, because of others, as others have said, 40% of GPs told the Scottish Association of Mental Health that they had not referred anyone for psychological therapies recently because waiting times are too long. So we in fact have a huge hidden waiting list with enormous unmet need uh, as the appropriate treatment or therapy for their condition is ruled out due to long waiting times. And again, as Malcolm Chisholm said, 
given that one in three GP appointments relates to mental health, yet 85% of GPs told Samich that there are gaps in the service provision and 90% of GPs in the same survey wanted more information on local social prescribing opportunities. So if the GPs don't know about social prescribing, then the patient cannot possibly be referred to the service. So there's certainly work to be done on that issue. On criminal justice, uh, uh, I think Commitment 32 undertakes to increase the effective use of community payback orders, which were introduced in 2010, to help prevent people going to prison when what they actually needed was mental health treatment and support. We all supported that. Yet, only 74 out of 10,000 community payback orders issued in 2011-12 included a mental health requirement. So 70 out of 10,000, uh, we need to do an awful lot more there. Access to CAMS, only half of health boards achieved the 26-week waiting time target and only five of the 14 health boards currently achieve the 18-week target. The only main land board achieving this target is Dumfries and Galloway. And I think it's quite concerning that Grampian, only 54% meet the target and Tayside, only 50%. But just as worryingly is the increase, need to wind up, Ms. The, the increase in referrals uh, to CAMS. Um, I think the focus on uh, recruitment of psychologists and uh, psychiatrists is an issue, given that there were eight vacancies last year for learning disabilities and none were filled. So, more to do, but that's me finished, Presiding Thank officer. you, Ms Scanlon. I now call on Jenny Mara uh, to wind up the Labour Party. Six minutes, Ms Mara. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I also welcome uh, the new Minister to his post? And can I say this afternoon, Presiding Officer, that... Um, I'm new to, to my post as well in, in the health brief and I hope that we can actually start together on this brief and put mental health right at the centre of our health agenda in Scotland and I hope that for the Minister that mental health will be his personal passion and something that he will drive because I think everyone across this chamber would agree that it is one of the biggest health challenges facing Scotland at the moment. Um, I think this is a problem not just specific to Scotland. I was doing quite a lot of reading over Christmas presiding officer and comparing our health record to that of uh, Finland. And of course, they are seeing mental health uh, problems increasing as well. And I think we must be really bold about the challenges ahead of us, presiding officer. I think we need to look internationally. Um, we need to be bold and ambitious. And I really hope that the minister will rise to that occasion. And I wanted to make the personal pledge to him today that there is so much that we need to look at on the mental health agenda. And it is disappointing that the Scottish Government has only taken the opportunity in its own debating time since 2007 twice to debate mental health. And I hope that working with the Minister, we can turn this around. And I want to pledge to him today that if he would like to debate mental health in detail and different aspects of how our services and communities are coping with mental health and trying to prevent it, if he would like to debate this every time time we return from recess, then Labour would wholeheartedly welcome that and meet that challenge. And I would also like to pledge to him today to work hand in hand with him on initiatives to make sure that we can put prevention of mental health right at the centre of our health agenda in Scotland. Presiding officer, if I can touch specifically on one aspect of prevention that I don't think has been covered yet this afternoon, educational psychology. It has been highlighted by the Scottish Children's Services Coalition. They have asked the Scottish Government in their briefing today to urgently address funding issues for training educational psychologists. Presiding officer, it would surprise me if members across this chamber have not experienced in their surgeries families coming to them asking about the waiting lists for educational psychologists for their children to be seen in, in their schools and assessed by an educational psychologist. The waiting lists are long and if we are truly going to tackle a preventative agenda on this, Minister, we must look seriously at this. 
Training, if I can tell you, Minister, for educational psychologists is an issue. The bursaries were withdrawn in 2012 and it is now a postgraduate course in Scotland that isn't funded. I have had people at my own surgery looking to, um, to put their immense talents into educational psychology but not actually being able to afford to do so. And I asked Mike Russell, when he was Education Secretary, if he could readdress this funding and actually provide funding um, to pay the fees of students that are going to dedicate their skills to the health service on not greatly increased salaries. An educational psychologist earns roughly £30,000 a year. And I would be happy to work hand in hand with the Minister if he would make this a priority to address. Presiding officer, if I can turn to some of the contributions this afternoon, I thought Mary Scanlon made an excellent contribution. She talked about the government's report card on this. Um, she highlighted the paucity of debates and called for an, an annual update, but I hope she might back my call to look really seriously at this on a more regular than annual uh, basis. She talked about the importance of measuring mental health outcomes. And she raised, I know, a point that the Minister will have taken note of, of the number of children that are being treated in adult psychiatric wards has actually increased over the last year. And I hope again that this is one of the urgent points of action that the Minister will take away from today's debate. Presiding Officer, both Jim Hume and Malcolm Chisholm raised uh, the points of the lack of the, the, the organisations and GPs not making referrals because the waiting lists are so long. I would also like to hear an early indication from the Minister on what can be done about that and the mass of unmet need on non-referrals. Presiding officer, this is an issue particularly close to my heart. I have visited uh, organisations in Dundee that deal with, that um, provide opportunities for young people uh, to come together, young people that have been affected and friends with other young people in our communities that have uh, taken their own lives. And I hope that the minister will really commit this afternoon to make his whole time in government to really focus um, very strictly on prevention and see what we can do here in Scotland about mental health. Presiding officer, if I can turn to the um, motion and amendments. You've got 30 we, seconds. Yes, we will be supporting the government motion this afternoon and there is much in the Conservative and Liberal amendments that we do support. But I understand that if our amendment passes tonight, and the Minister has indicated the Government's support for the Labour amendment, that actually the Conservative and Liberal amendments would delete our amendment. So although we agree with the content of them, we won't be able to support them. I hope that strikes that note of consensus. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on Jamie Hepburn to wind up the debate. Minister, you have to... Uh, 5.30. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Officer, can I say, Jenny Mara uh, said she hoped that mental health will be my passion. I hope that uh, she and uh, members will recognise hopefully the fact that the first debate I have brought to the Chamber is on this uh, topic gives uh, at least some indication of the priority in which I place uh, ensuring that we uh, 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 tackle uh, mental health uh, disorders and uh, improve Scotland's mental uh, health. Uh, this debate has been a useful one, uh, President Officer Paul Martin uh, felt it had been robust and Mark Macdonald uh, felt it had been uh, constructive. That might at first glance uh, seem to be uh, mutually exclusive concepts. I think actually both uh, have uh, been uh, true and I think uh, the debate has uh, benefited uh, accordingly and uh, I know that Richard Simpson, Jenny Mara, Mary Scanlon uh, feel that this is a subject that we should debate uh, more regularly given that this has been a constructive uh, process. I'm certainly happy uh, to look at uh, bringing the uh, subject back on a, a more regular uh, basis. President officer, a, a lot has been said over the course of uh, the debate. It's uh, unlikely I'll be able to respond to every uh, point. I should say if there's any uh, particular issue that members raised that uh, I, I am not able to respond to, I'm not able to refer to uh, just now, they should feel free uh, to contact me uh, directly. But I want to start by uh, referring to uh, Mary Scanlon's uh, opening uh, contribution because she raised some concerns about the mental health strategy. I'm happy to uh, provide uh, an update in uh, relation to uh, some of the uh, areas that she uh, referred to. Uh, she talked about... Uh, and, but I've not even got to uh, updating you yet, Ms Scanlon, but absolutely. Mary Scanlon. 
No, I just wanted to say that I have submitted about eight or nine questions on it. So uh, if you want to address someone else's, I, uh, most of the ones I raised today are put in written questions. So uh, I look forward to seeing them. Well, I, I think for the benefit of the Chamber, Ms Scanlon, I'll, I'll still mention uh, them anyway. So commitment one uh, in relation to uh, the Sandra uh, Grant, what I can uh, inform uh, the Chamber, the report will be published uh, later this year. Uh, Mary Scanlon was concerned that uh, technology hasn't uh, featured as part of uh, the mental health strategy. I can inform her and uh, the rest of uh, the uh, Chamber that, in fact, the, uh, the uh, NHS uh, 24 is project managing a uh, 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 technology-based uh, process uh, uh, its acronym is Mastermind. I won't go through the full uh, 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 title, but essentially it's to do with telehealth, and they are piloting that in four health board uh, regions, Shetland, Grampian, Lanarkshire, and Fife. So techn technology is featuring as part of the process. Uh, commitment uh, 26 to audit the inpatient uh, estate. I can say that it uh, took place in October uh, 2014, and findings were published uh, later this year. And uh, uh, commitment uh, 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 30 uh, in relation to uh, women in the criminal justice system with borderline personality disorder. I recognise that is an important uh, area and work is ongoing to improve mental health service to address uh, these challenges through building on the work uh, underway uh, at HMP Cottonvale, testing uh, the effectiveness of training prison staff in a, a mentalisation approach to working with women uh, with borderline personality disorder and indeed uh, women who have experienced uh, uh, trauma. Um, Dennis Robertson it raised uh, an issue that I know is uh, very uh, close to him and his family in relation to uh, eating disorders. Can I say to uh, Mr Robertson if he has uh, specific suggestions as to how we can focus our efforts better in this area? I'm always uh, willing uh, to discuss that particular issue with him. Uh, Sandra White and uh, John Mason uh, raised uh, between them a variety of uh, local issues uh, in relation to the Charlie Reid uh, Centre to uh, GAMH and also uh, the uh, closure of day centres, something I know that also my colleague Bob Doris has uh, campaigned on. One moment, Minister. There's far too much talking from those coming uh, into the chamber. I'm sure you're all pleased to see your colleagues, but could we uh, save the Happy New Year's and the handshakes for outside, Minister? Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. Uh, what I should say in relation to these uh, uh, local changes is ultimately, of course, they are a matter uh, for local authorities, but I do appreciate that uh, the removal of services or uh, the reduction can impact on the service use, and the, I suppose it reminds us, uh, it reminds us that decision makers have to uh, carefully think through any uh, decision. Linda Fabiani uh, spoke of the unique uh, nature of new towns. She will understand that this is something I uh, readily recognise too, uh, as indeed you will as well, I should uh, say, presiding officer. Uh, and she's talked of the uh, idea of cross uh, portfolio uh, working to better deliver services in uh, the community, and particularly in relation to where uh, people uh, are in their community. And of course, that's always uh, a good thing to do, and where we can uh, do that in this area, uh, we will. Can I turn to uh, the uh, amendments, uh, presiding officer? Uh, firstly, uh, Mary uh, Scans. Can I say uh, I recognise the points that uh, Mary Scanlon makes in uh, her uh, amendment? I particularly pick up uh, what she says about young people being placed in appropriately in adult beds, something uh, that Jenny uh, Mara uh, said, and you know that I, I accept that should uh, not happen. I'm disappointed to see uh, the number of uh, young people being admitted to adult uh, wards it uh, has uh, increased. And of course, we expect uh, that uh, we sh this uh, should be reduced. I should, of course, point out uh, briefly. Uh, thank the Minister for taking the intervention on this point. Uh, does the Minister then uh, agree that there is a transition period that we need to be looking at moving children from the sort of children's services into adult services, and that tr transitional period could be extended so young people, if appropriate, could stay within the CAMS service rather than moving on to adults? Minister? Well, I, I think that is essentially the flip side of the point I was actually about to make, because in uh, the circumstances we are talking about here, uh, most of these admissions are among young people aged 16 or 17, uh, where an adult facility actually might, in certain cases, be clinically judged uh, to be a more appropriate setting. But, uh, no, nevertheless, uh, I do expect uh, uh, almost all children and young people admitted uh, to adult wards to be discharged uh, quickly and transferred to uh, uh, CAMS uh, uh, settings uh, uh, instead. And I should, of course, point out that we are increasing uh, uh, bed numbers in the north uh, of Scotland uh, for children and adolescents, uh, and that uh, new unit uh, will be ready uh, later 
uh, uh, this year. What I should say, though, is I cannot accept uh, the Tory amendment because the quality of mental health services is not measured in nationally set uh, numbers of beds or staff numbers, although, uh, as I have alluded to, they are uh, both important parts of a well-functioning system. It is the quality of outcomes, clinical outcomes, social and personal outcomes, uh, that matter. Can I turn uh, to Mr uh, Hume's uh, amendment? I do not accept uh, Mr uh, Hume's uh, amendment. I agree uh, that we need to ensure that mental and physical health have equal recognition. I was somewhat perplexed when Mr Hume uh, responded to me to say that uh, the difference uh, here in Scotland as opposed to uh, England is that they have put it in legislation in England when I had already said to him that Section 1 of the National Health Service of Scotland Act 1978 that essentially uh, makes the same commitment here in Scotland. To be clear, Mr Hume, the National Health Service of Scotland Act 1978 is legislation. And I, could, uh, I think we take the concerns about parity uh, rather more seriously from the Liberal Democrats, uh, President Officer, if they had not in uh, March 2014 uh, uh, overseen a funding decision made by NHS England uh, imposing a proportionately greater funding cut, 20 per cent more uh, for mental health services than acute hospitals, which was, of course, widely criticised by mental health organisations at the time. The so Minister is in his last 15 accept, seconds. I cannot accept uh, the Lib Dem amendment. I am very happy to accept the Labour one. I think it is uh, constructively made. I think this has been a useful debate, uh, President Officer, and I look forward to bringing back uh, mental health to this chamber as an important issue for us to continually debate. Thank you. That concludes the debate on mental health. The next item of business is consideration of motion number 11986 in the name of Michael Matheson on the Serious Crime Bill UK legislation. I call Michael Matheson to move the motion. Secretary. Thank you. Question this motion will be put in decision time to which we now come. There are eight questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is amendment number 11976.2 in the name of Claire Baker, which seeks to amend motion number 11976 in the name of Fiona Hislop on winter festivals be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The amendment is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 11976.1 in the name of Liz Smith, which seeks to amend motion number 11976 in the name of Fiona Hislop on winter festivals be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11976.1 in the name of Liz Smith is as follows. Yes, 20. No, 61. There were 33 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11976 in the name of Fiona Hislop as amended on Wednesday festivals be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next question is amendment number 11975.2 in the name of Richard Simpson, which seeks to amend motion number 11975 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on mental health be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11975.2 in the name of Richard Simpson is as follows. Yes, 109. No, 5. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. 
The next question is amendment number 11975.3 in the name of Mary Scanlon, which seeks to amend motion number 11975 in the name of Jamie Hepburn on mental health be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast the votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11975.3 in the name of Mary Scanlon is as follows. Yes, 15. No, 99. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is amendment number 11975.1 in the name of Jim Hume, which seeks to amend motion number 11975 in the name of Jimmy Hepburn on mental health be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 11975.1 in the name of Jim Hume is as follows. Yes, 18. No, 96. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11975 in the name of Jamie Hepburn as amended on mental health be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 11975 in the name of Jamie Hepburn as amended is as follows. Yes, 109. No, 5. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. The next question is that motion number 11986 in the name of Michael Matheson on the Serious Crime Bill UK legislation be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members should leave the chamber, should do so quickly and quietly.